Since 1952, the Jayco Herald Sun Tour has been the race to win on Victorian roads. From Australian cycling icons, Mockridge, Trevorrow and Gerrans, to some of the greats from around the globe, Wiggins, Froome and Chavez, it's a world-class honour roll. Starting at the tranquil setting of Mitchelton Winery, the race quickly becomes the most mountainous on Australian soil. Into the high country and the peloton will tackle Falls Creek. Make the trek from Bright and over the top of Tawonga Gap, then yet another alpine battle atop Mount Buller, before finishing at Melbourne's Botanic Gardens. There are four World Tour teams on the start line, each of them with a target on their back as the best of Australia's next crop of international stars are out to take a big scalp and show just how good they are. Who will join the honour roll in 2020? And with Melbourne providing the backdrop, it's Jai Hindley who was on the brink of adding his name to that prestigious honour roll. Hello and welcome to the Gumby World Stage 5 final day of racing in the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Matthew Keenan with you, joined by Robbie McEwen. Robbie, Jai Hindley, he's in the box seat with a 10 second advantage. He's had a brilliant start to the season. He's been fantastic in this Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Two wins on the two summit finishes of Falls Creek and Mount Buller. He's dominated. He will take yellow all the way. He won't be beaten for my money. Before the best of world cycling get a chance to ride around the Botanic Gardens, some of the locals get an opportunity to ride around this course. And this is a course that was used for the Commonwealth Games in 2006 and for the last couple of years as the final stage of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. It's a beautiful spot to ride. It's a great spot to ride around the Botanical Gardens and what a great opportunity to ride on closed roads in the centre of the city in, with this backdrop, relaxing, getting a few miles in in this beautiful sunshine and for all ages. Oh, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? You see young kids out there, grandparents are out there as well and this is what all sports need is introducing the young kids into it and be able to do it with those that are at the other end a little bit more experienced. But this race was preceded by the Lexus of Blackburn Herald Sun Tour. The women's race, it came down to the battle on Falls Creek. A 30-kilometre climb, the yellow jersey, Alina Sierra, she surrendered with 450 metres to go. It was extraordinary. All right. uh 30 kilometre climb and to get dropped with 450 metres to go. It was Ella Harris, the Kiwi, and she just smashed it out all the way to the line. It was just a race of attrition all the way up Falls Creek. Lucy Kennedy for the second year running. She goes out the winner of the Lexus of Blackburn Herald Sun Tour. It was Jamie Gunning in second position overall. Alina Sierra was in third place. As for the men's race, that all got underway at the Mitchelton Winery in Nagambi. Let's take a look at it. Nagambi to Shepparton for stage one. Mitchelton Winery playing host to the start of the stage, a place that you and I have both had the pleasure of visiting. Oh, what a pleasure it is to go down to the Mitchelton Winery, sample a few of the new vintage, maybe get a taste of some of the older wines as well. But as they rushed into Shepparton, in the middle in pink was Hoffland, but on the right in the red, Alberta Danese from Sunweb. He held out Caden Groves, got his team off to a good start in the tour and took his first World Tour win and of course, the yellow leader's jersey. It was then on to Falls Creek for the second stage. It got underway in Beechworth. And then the big surprise came when pre-race favourite Simon Yates crumbled. We're used to seeing him win mountain stages in the Grand Tours. Last year, two of them in the Tour de France. Not quite there yet, but these young guns certainly were. Jay Hindley went to the front. And then Damien Housen, he beat Hindley here last time. And the revelation, Seb Berwick in third. And Hindley takes over yellow from his teammate, Danese. It's all Sunweb. Another day for the sprinters from Bright into Wangaratta, the longest stage of the race, 178 kilometres. Once again, Danese was in the mix, but this time it was Caden Groves who got the win. He reversed the order. The sprinters emerging at the top. Two young sprinters, they were teammates a season ago. Now they're rivals, but you can see that they get along well. The sign-on before yesterday's stage to Mount Buller. The yellow jersey looks so relaxed. Oh, well, he would look relaxed. He won on Falls Creek. He knew he had everybody's measure there, and he's got a very strong team to rely on as well. It turns out his young West Australian teammate, Michael Storer, is the man wearing number 23, has been a super domestique for Jay Hindley. And then to the last kilometre, it was the rider in the Visit Victoria white jersey, Seb Berwick, who was challenging the yellow jersey of Jai Hindley. 
but it was the Western Australian Hindley who was just too strong, making it two from two and the mountaintop finishes. He won the stage. It was then Berwick, an impressive second place on the stage, which moved him up to second place overall. He has been outstanding throughout this race. Some champagne, but one day to come for Jai Hindley. His overall race lead is now 10 seconds ahead of the Queenslander, Sebastian Berwick. In third position, it is still Damien Housen, the rider that won this race overall back in 2017. Nielsen Paulus, the American, is in fourth position. Jesse Hewitt in fifth place. That's not bad for a guy that races predominantly throughout Asia and on the local circuit in Australia. Jay Vine then in sixth position, Michael Storer was seventh. These have been the standout riders. Hindley and Berwick have been battling for the yellow jersey. Housen joins them on the podium. Nielsen Paulus and then Jesse Hewitt. The sprinters today, Robbie, the Nasey, Groves, Hoffman and Mikael Ram. But Ben Hill, he has been the most aggressive. He's been aggressive. He's been in the points jersey for a few days. We saw him have that incident with cramp a couple of days ago, which really knocked his chances around. He needs to perform well today if he wants to wrap up that jersey. Let's take a look at the course for today's final stage. It's the Gumby World Stage 5, and it is 22 laps around the city of Melbourne. After having confronted the first four stages through Shepparton to Falls Creek, Wangaratta, and then yesterday's stage to the top of Mount Buller. Today, it is the circuit race. It's right in the heart of town. 22 laps, 89.1 kilometres. There are two intermediate sprints in the race for the green jersey, the Bright Brewery green jersey. Anderson Street, that's the most difficult part. Yeah, that's the uphill section which brings them into the last kilometre. It's not just purely for the sprinters. Someone could go out on the attack up Anderson Street the final time and hold them all off. As for what tactics the riders might employ, let's get down to Pat Shaw, who's got plenty of experience riding this race. Talking Tactics, Gumbaya World, Stage 5 of the 2020 Jaco Herald Sun Tour. We're here in Melbourne for 22 laps of a four-kilometre circuit. Jai Hindley leads the general classification, but he'll need to fight all the way to the line. It's a sprinter's race today. There'll be spills and high speeds. Probably 75 kilometres as they cross the finish line to see today's winner. The fight will be between... Alberto Danese, Team Sunweb, and Mitchell and Scott's Caden Groves. And that's who I'm going with, Caden Groves from Mitchell and Scott. Good to get the, not once had the monkey off the back, but good to get your, your first win with the team. But as a sprinter, you get one, you're hungry for more, aren't you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if uh, the way I rode on stage three, uh, I think uh, I can go for another stage win today. So I'm confident in the boys and, yeah, we're really excited to get out there. Yeah, it's been uh, yeah, a great week for us. We had already three wins and uh, second place. So, yeah, we, we already have done our job, so... We try just to keep Jai uh, safe today and uh, hopefully I can go for a sprint. Jai Henley from Team Sunweb. Jai, final day. Here we go. You've got a 10 second advantage. It's not an absolute done deal, is it? Uh, no, nah, definitely not. It's uh, not over till the race is over. So, yeah, we're going to go out there and uh, try to defend the jersey as best as possible. And yeah, it's a short day, so I think you can expect some aggressive racing. And what puts Jai Hindley in a strong position to defend that overall race lead is the fact that he has one of the strongest teams in the peloton in the world surrounding him. The Sunweb team, not only does it include the yellow jersey, it includes one of the pre-stage favourites, Alberto Danese, who was the winner of the opening day, which was from Nagambi through to Shepparton. We pan in over the Botanic Gardens, the Melbourne Grammar School grounds in the background. The green jersey, the Bright Brewery green jersey, being worn at the start of the day by Ben Hill. Will it? at the end of the day. We'll wait and see. He'll certainly be looking to get into the breakaway to take that classification. The Go Tafe polka dot jersey for the King of the Mounts classification. Today, it's been worn on loan by James Whelan. The actual leader of that competition is Jai Hindley, but he wears the yellow. Underway for the final stage, it's Gumby World Stage 5, and straight away, the green jersey, Ben Hill. You could have put your house on it. He's attacked. Ben Hill, he never misses an opportunity to go on the attack. He's been in a lot of breakaways already in this tour. Came undone in one of them, <laughs> cramping just three kilometres before an intermediate sprint, which uh, crueled his chances to take out this green jersey. 
He's trying to make sure of it today. Make sure he gets into that first break. And the whole field knows why he's doing it. He literally came under. He came out of his pedal. Robbie, he was rolling through to the front to do a turn of pace and crammed from front position in the breakaway, as you said, three kilometres from that intermediate sprint. If he had have stayed in that group, he would have definitely won the intermediate sprint. Without question, he was the quickest in that group. And then he wouldn't need to attack today. He still would have, mind you. But he would have had the bright brewery green jersey sewn up. It was extraordinary. Ben Hill can never be accused of not pulling his weight in a breakaway. Uh, always has a really good go at it, Ben Hill. And I guess, if anything, you could have accused him of being too aggressive. I sometimes wonder what he would be able to do in the finale of the race if he just took his time, eased into it, stayed in the wheels and really rode the finale with the favourites. But in this case, he is doing the right thing to try and get himself into the first break. And there he is. He's had four riders come across to join him. And have a look at the quality just in front of him. Carter Turnbull from Corda Mentha. Off to the left, Michael Freeberg from ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast. Number 32 is Alexander Catterford of Israel Startup Nation and Connor Murtag of Oliver's Real Food Racing. That is a really high quality group on the move from the get go. And the looks over the shoulder, and there is the aerial. There's another bigger group trying to get away from the peloton as well. Make In fact, no, that is the, that is the break. And that is the peloton strung out in single file. Everybody wants a piece of the action early. They make their way past the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl. This, I get the impression, is going to be quick. It looked like that group was getting some leeway as we had up behind and the gap opened up, but there's been a big and violent reaction. First, also joining this front group. Importantly for Ben Hill, Robbie, the first of those intermediate sprints is after the conclusion or at the conclusion of the fifth lap. So you've really got to get things underway, build a healthy buffer. I know one thing's for certain. This one gets shut down. He will go again. Number 41, that's Mark O'Brien. He attacked with about three k's to go on the stage in the Wangaratta. We spoke to him afterwards and he said he was sitting in the peloton. He couldn't work out why nobody was attacking. So he attacked. And then he realised, oh, it's a headwind. <laughs> you can get lulled into that, uh, well, you know, rocked off to sleep, as it were, sitting in the peloton. Thinking, well, it's pretty easy. We're just cruising along. And suddenly, when you do put your face up in the wind, you realise how hard it is. The rider in the red colours right in the middle of the road, that's Rob Power. He rides for the Sunweb team. He's a teammate of the overall race leader, which is Jai Hindley. This is Marcus Cooley now going through in the Sapuri colours. Well, Marcus Cooley, we saw him do a fantastic ride in the recent national championships around Bunningyong. He finished up at the end of the day with a bronze medal after an incredibly aggressive ride. Speak of aggressive, it's the man in green. It's not the incredible Hulk. It's Ben Hill trying to join this breakaway. We said he wouldn't stop, and he's not going to make us look silly. Uh, he's got a really simple theory for getting into the right breakaway, the winning breakaway. Yeah, just go with all of them. Correct. <laughs> it's not a bad theory. It's the Thomas de Ghent theory of getting in the right breakaway. Yeah. How do you always pick the right break? I mean, all of them. Yeah. And already slipping down towards the back, scene number 92, that's Michael Freeberg. He was in the breakaway just a couple of moments ago. Oh, he'll bide his time. He's had his, had his go, tried to get off the front. I think we'll see Freeberg wait now to try and set up the final sprint and see if they can get themselves a, a stage win over the more highly favoured sprinters like Danese, Hofflin, and, of course, Caden Groves, who told us in his pre-race interview, I can win today. I'm confident. He oh, can. really? He can win. Oh, absolutely. It's, I think it's a, a finish that really suits him too. Yes, he's a sprinter, but he's a real strong man. He copes well with a few sharp little hills along the way. And that run up Alexander Street, that really is a tough one. Getting yourself in position, staying up near the front and keeping that little bit in the legs for the actual sprint. So it's a case of almost two sprints within the last kilometre. And this is the first chance for us to take a look at how quick that approach is towards the finish. There goes the Visit Victoria white jersey of Seb Berwick, whose climb yesterday to Mount Buller. Sure, he didn't win, but he did not make a single mistake, and he was outstanding. He's on the front. He the well, Matt, Seb Berwick, he was the reason I tuned in to watch the race up to Mount Buller yesterday. I really wanted to see if he was able to back up that performance he did at Falls Creek where he finished third on the stage behind Hindley and Housen and he did not disappoint and even better than that 
he just lit the race up with that attack in the final kilometre. As we watch the opening stages of Stage 5, gun by World Stage 5, the breakaway's trying to get itself established. The interview after the stage, this is the Shrine of Remembrance that we get a chance to take a look at. And indeed, lest we forget. Yesterday, the interview with Seb afterwards, he said with Dave Sanders, the team director for his squad, they didn't do the whole last climb. They just did the last 1.5 kilometres four times. And I thought that was really interesting. Dave Sanders, he's renowned as a, a coach and a, a mentor of young cyclists and really getting the best out of them. And I think what was so significant about only doing the last kilometre and a half of a 16-kilometre climb is he's saying to Seb Berwick, you are going to be here. Don't worry about the rest. You will be here at the front when it counts, and this is the moment where you're going to make the race. Can you imagine the confidence that gives a young rider? Don't worry about all of that. You will be here. Yeah, I thought that was so significant, the fact that it was only the last 1.5 kilometres. And to get that confidence from a guy like Dave Sanders, who's been around the sport since day one, his father was significant in the career of the great Phil Anderson and Alan Piper. It's in Davo's DNA to guide young cyclists to the top of the tree. And I think when Dave Sanders tells you something like that, it comes with so much credibility. He's not going to sugarcoat it. No. He's not going to give you false hope. But if he can see, and he has, he has the eye for it, time and time again he's done it with young riders. If he tells you, you can win here and this is where it's going to go down and this is what's going to happen, you need to believe it because I know it. That gives those young riders so much, so much confidence because yep. they've seen it happen with others. And that element that you just mentioned, he doesn't sugarcoat it. That's why when he does say it, because he never sugarcoats it, that gives it so much more weight. These multiple efforts of riders trying to get away. Good to see the green colours once again of Oliver's Real Food Racing. And the team doing the chasing, that is the Nero Continental team, which is trying to close things down. This Israel startup nation through to the front now, but everything's still yet. Yeah, and look back in about fifth wheel, that green jersey with the blue on the sleeve of Ben Hill. So he's making sure he doesn't miss anything, staying around the front, waiting for the next opportunity to try and get away. If things go continue like this, well, we may see a full bunch coming to that first intermediate sprint. And that's where Ben Hill, he needs to take those full points. But the Botanic Gardens, Robbie, they're so tranquil. Yet the racing is quite the opposite. Quarter meant the Australian national team coming through to the front. This is a team that's been really active. And here is an attack now from the quarter Mentha team on Alexander Street. So it's a good, hard acceleration. Ben Hill, he's still tracking this. They thought he'd just out of the corner, accelerate and get away, but everybody following the wheel. Here's a counter-attack now on the left-hand side. James Whelan, go TAFE King of the Mountains jersey. He's actually in second position in that classification. And as they crest the top of the hill, little gap opening up indeed a group forming behind this acceleration well the fastest lap so far that has been liam white from oliver's real food racing so a way that you can get the fastest lap is to start near the back of the peloton and work your way through the peloton so you're still within that group but you've done that lap ever so slightly quicker Sitting down towards so the back that, of the peloton. As, as the afternoon goes on, we're going to now, we've got, we've got a benchmark, but we're going to get uh, a time next to those, and we'll see who set the fastest lap absolutely of the whole race. I do expect it to come in the final lap. Ben Hill, again, in the breakaway, the green jersey, sitting in second last position in this group. Well, his finish line of this stage is at the first intermediate sprint at the end of lap five. Here they come through to the finish area. Really good crowds gathering here in the Royal Botanical Gardens here in the centre of Melbourne. Uh, just a beautiful summer's day as well. Around the 25, 26 degrees, nice and warm. In this breakaway is Jesse Hewitt. Jesse Hewitt sits in fifth position overall at a minute and 26 seconds down in the blue colours of the Sepura team. That's not good for Ben Hill because the team of Sunweb, they won't want someone within a minute and a half going up the road. 
So they won't be able to just let that one go. And I'm sure the riders who are just in front of him on general classification will also be taking an interest. Savvy little move, though, by Jesse Hewitt. Done by a world stage five of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. This is the 67th edition of the race. And at the moment, the yellow jersey looks as if it will be secured all the way to the finish by Jai Hindley, who's riding this race for the third time. And he said yesterday after the stage victory, he's second this year to the top of Mount Buller, that it's a race he really targeted this season. I think that is just a, a great place to start for, you know, these young guys in the World Tour. They, they have the big dreams of riding Grand Tours and maybe winning a stage. But I, you just, you've got to start at the start. You might be in the World Tour, but don't think you're too good or too big to skip or not aim for races like the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. You've got to get out there and execute and win in the races that are at your level at the moment and then build from there. I, I think you know, it's a good thing that Jai Hindley has targeted this race and particularly targeted those two mountaintop finishes. That was the, the type of races he was really excelling in as an amateur, as an under-23 in Europe, and you know, beating the, the world's best under-23s, who are mostly all now in the World Tour as well. But to do it actually as a full-fledged professional, you've got to almost temper your expectations in those big races win something whatever level this is a fantastic start yeah it's important to demonstrate that ability to perform under pressure this breakaway they're trying to get themselves established they're trying to work well together but the intensity is so high and the presence of number 57 is probably disrupting them ever so slightly number 57 sits in fifth position in the general classification in terms of what impact that has on the overall standings he's not close enough to threaten the yellow jersey he's a minute and 26 seconds down and he's still more than 30 seconds behind fourth place nielsen powerless they can afford to let this break go out and build a lead but i wouldn't think that sunweb would be, would be prepared to even let him become virtual leader on the road let the break get more than a minute and a half so maybe something like a 45 seconds and just hold them at that even if they get out to 45 seconds and they're out there for five laps, I know one man who'll be very happy with that situation is Ben Hill. And you see back in the peloton now, spreading across the road, Sunweb at the front, trying to shut things down. Israel Startup Nation, they have a rider in the break as well. So now that pattern is forming, the break is off the front, but they will keep a fairly tight control on it. It is giving an opportunity for that breakaway at least to get established enough for the man in the green colours at the front, Ben Hill, to be able to win the first of the intermediate sprints. Coming down towards the close of the third lap of the fifth stage, gun by world fifth stage of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour, and our first serious breakaway is starting to build up an advantage. Shane Nick, put some music to line, please.
hearing him loud enough. Good. And I'll just get you to talk to Robbie to make sure he's happy. No, 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 don't care. So don't care at the moment. Just guys, you guys just talk to each other, make sure it's loud enough. Port Phillip Bay and then on to the MCG. Melbourne renowns itself as the sporting capital of the world and the Yarra River famous for its rowing. Flinders Street st train station, the laneways for its food and also the rooftop terraces. Plus, of course, there is Federation Square and then the drive down the Great Ocean Road through to the Twelve Apostles and the vineyards of the Yarra Valley. Breakaway group is established. It has a lead of just a handful of seconds. They're not too far away from coming through to get the whistle or the bell for the first of the intermediate sprints in the race for the Bright Brewery points classification. In the breakaway is the current leader of that classification, which is Ben Hill, who rides for Team Bridge Lane. And if he can get the points at this first intermediate sprint, that secures the classification for him. And he can finally relax even momentarily and start to think about potentially winning the stage by staying in the breakaway. This is the breakaway group. Flick of the elbow at the front from number 124, and that is Jay Vine. And Jay Vine, he is also well placed in the general classification. He sits in sixth position overall. Number 17 rolling through for EF, that is James Whelan. 102 is Brendan, Brendan Davids from the Oliver's Real Food Racing Team. 92, the Australian National Road Champion from last year, Michael Freeberg, has made the break once again from ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast. At the back of the group for Israel Startup Nation in the white and the blue colours, that's Alexander Catterford. This is a strong group, Robbie McEwen. It is a strong group, and, and we saw earlier, of course, Ben Hill has been in every move. Michael Freeberg also made the first move, and he's back again. He let himself drop right back in the peloton. He took a lap or two, just recover, just check everything out, and then straight back to the front, off the front again, and into the group. And it's a strong one. And I tell you what, forget about a procession on the final day. With riders up there in fifth and sixth overall, yeah, having a crack at improving their positions. And between those two, when it comes to the immediate sprint, expect those two to do battle for the time bonuses. Because Jesse Ewart and Jay Vine, fifth and sixth place, they're locked together on the same time at a minute and 26 seconds behind. So the time bonus is there between those two. That can be the difference between saying I was top five at the Jayco Herald Sun Tour versus I, I was, was top sixth. ten. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you wouldn't even say top ten. No, no, you go with the six. But it's a big difference, isn't it? It is a difference. I was just one spot moving up. I mean, you're going to fight for everything you can get. It'll be good to see those guys going head-to-head -head in intermediate sprint. We don't expect the others in this group to challenge Ben Hill for the points. They've got nothing to gain by doing that. I, I would think that Michael Freeberg is the fastest man in this group, but he's got nothing to gain by snipping the points away from Ben Hill. But the other two being in fifth and sixth overall, they're very good climbers. They've performed well on the two mountaintop finishes of Falls Creek and Mount Buller. Interested to see how they sprint. So that's Jesse Ewart, number 57 in the blue colours. He's in fifth position in the general classification. Third from the front, number 124, that's Jay Vine. He's in sixth position. But those two guys, they're both locked together at a minute and 26 seconds down. Whistle goes for the first of the intermediate sprints, the second last of this year's race. A 38-second gap for our leaders over the peloton as we have a look at them coming out from underneath the trees here in the Royal Botanical Garden. Sunweb most certainly down there controlling things, but they're getting some help. Education first in the pink, and it looks like also the Israel Startup Nation team. Well, 
they'll be thinking about the sprint finish for Mikel Ram. Mitchelton Scott also there riding for Caden Grove. So it's not just control by Sunweb. It's everybody who's interested in bringing this down to a bunch sprint. We have a new fastest lap for the 4.1 kilometres. It's 4 minutes and 58 seconds. And that's courtesy of James Whelan, who's in that breakaway. Two riders from Mitchelton Scott down towards the back. The big Kiwi, Sam Buley, along with the Australian National Road Champion, Cameron Meyer. This is going to be an intriguing sprint, Robbie. You've, even as a neutral commentator, I'm, I'm hoping that Ben Hill can get it done because he's he's Thanks. tried so hard all to get in all these breaks, but he had that cramp that we spoke about that prevented him from sprinting the other day. And that's not even the sprint that I'm talking about. <laughs> the sprint between the climbers. Oh, that sprint, yeah. Even if one of them finishes third and the other one's not in the top three, then that one, that rider, whichever one it is, between Vine and Hewitt, secures, for now at least, fifth place. At the moment, it's Jesse Hewitt who's in fifth position on a countback because of positions on the stages across the line. Peloton is strung out in single file. Their advantage is 38 seconds. So at the very least, they will be contesting the first of these intermediate sprints in the race for the green jersey, the Bright Brewery points classification. But importantly, the time bonuses. Three seconds for first, two and one for the minor placings. Of course, there is a second intermediate sprint as well at the finish of lap 15. So if they're going to get to that one, they've got to stay out there for quite a while. 22 laps of this four-kilometre circuit, just a tickle over. So that's Jay Vine off to the left. In the blue is Jesse Hewitt. They are foxing, watching each other. They know the green jersey hill will be going to the sprint. So Jay Vine gets right behind him. Very clever. Already now, they're still quite a way away from the sprint. But he's assuming the position. You're going to follow the wheel of Hill. Shoes are being tightened up. It's like it's the, the finish of the stage and they're coming in at the end of the day just for the intermediate sprint. So if they can just hold that wheel of Ben Hill. But it'll all start again. Hill now swings off. Vine, Vine goes through. We'll end up in front of him. So there'll be a whole new shuffle. And I wonder if maybe one of them will dare to go on the attack on Alexander Street. So well, I'm not a sprinter, I'm more of a climber. I'll go up the hill. David's at the back in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing. Number 92, the big figure of Michael Freeberg from ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast. He's having the conversation with Hewitt and Vine. He understands the situation, but he wants to keep the momentum within this group to try and survive, to win the stage. That's the prize that he's targeting. And that's really important for the others in this group that you know, it doesn't ruin the rhythm of this group. And Ben Hill, he's going to give absolutely everything. You probably need to sit on and recover after the sprint. He's going to go that hard to ensure that he gets the points. Meanwhile, at the back of the group, number 24, that's Alberto Denisi in the peloton. He's a chance to win the stage. Well, it's been a great battle in the sprints between Denisi, Hofflin and Caden Groves. Both Denisi and Caden Groves have got stage wins. Hofflin has been close. Seemed to me just on the front a little bit early a couple of days ago. On the finish into Wangaratta. This is the start of the tactical game for the sprint. Jay Vine is the right at the front in the white colours with the purple on his sleeves. The green Ben Hill, he wants the points. Vine wants the small time bonus. One kilometre to the finish line for the sprint. Well... Now it was Hewitt who was on the wheel of Ben Hill. So manoeuvring, <laughs> outmanoeuvring each other to get the wheel of the man in that green points classification jersey. This is on the back of the peloton. This is James Whelan at the front. James Whelan probably knows Anderson Street pretty well, having done repeats as a middle distance runner up here. The lap around the tan is very famous in Melbourne for running. Out to make the right hand turn, sweep back towards the Botanic Gardens. It's Whelan who leads Catterford in second position, then Jay Vine, followed by Hill, followed by Hewitt. Well, Vine's made himself a little bit vulnerable there, being in front of Ben Hill, and Hewitt is in the wheel. 
This is David's in the green colours. Now Ben Hill opens up the sprint. This is to secure the Bright Brewery points classification. Avine is in second position. He's chasing the time bonus. 200 metres. It's quick. It's slightly downhill. Hill maximising the points. The battle is on for fifth place in the general classification. Vine gets second position. So he moves up to fifth place overall by one second. That was a great battle. Hewitt was in the wheel of Ben Hill. But Ben Hill is much more explosive when he took off. It opened up a gap and Vine slotted straight into it. Got the wheel of Ben Hill like that. So Hewitt, although he's in the perfect position, he could not match that acceleration. It was almost like, after you, have a seat, please. Vine slotted straight in. They said, I'll have those seconds. Just at the end, he started to open himself up as he moved left. Hewitt started to come back at him, but that swaps those positions around. Vine into fifth, Hewitt into sixth. 45 seconds still the gap, and in 10 laps time, there's another intermediate sprint. We could see it swing back the other way yet. Yeah, it can still go the other way. And for the green jersey now, Ben Hill, he's got that classification secured. He's the winner of the Bright Brewery points classification. He cannot be overhauled. He just needs to finish the race. Does he ignore the second intermediate sprint and start thinking about the end of the race, the so replay the sprint? Well, here is the just the last 100 metres or so. You look at Vine in second wheel. He swings out, opens that gap, and then Hewitt says, well, I will have a go at that. Thanks very much. Runs back towards the slipstream of Hill. But Vine has done enough. Just. He gets the two seconds. Hewitt the one. And Ben Hill, he now owns the green jersey. And there he is, number 65. Going back to what you said, though, does he ignore the next one? Well, he can. I'm not sure if that's in his mentality to ignore the next one. Maybe just to put his stamp on it and say, no, I'll just take this one of small cash bonus for the intermediate sprint as well. But I think they'd all be better off really trying to ride for the win on the stage and see if they can hold off the sprinters' teams. However, they are very well organised behind and they're all sharing the work. Sunweb to protect the yellow jersey. Mitchelton Scott for Groves. Uh, Sunweb also for Danese, of course. Uh, education first for Marino Hofland. And Mikael Rehm from Israel Startup Nation has one of his teammates up the front as well. So plenty of chasers willing to just hold this break in check. They've gotten out to 45 seconds, but it looks like it's just stabilised at about that margin at the moment. Working smoothly together. But it's almost a, an even match-up with the number of riders in the break and the number of riders working behind. This is Jesse Hewitt, number 57, swings back in. So what's going through his mind now that he slipped from fifth place overall down to sixth? He has to make sure. I, th I think he's actually faster than Vine. Positioning. So I think the positioning let him down. His positioning was good. He did not anticipate that Ben Hill would kick so hard so and soon. open up the gap so soon and just leave that position open. And Vine was able to swing across and straight into it. But he'll be hoping now that he can stay out there for the next 10 laps, fight out the next one, see if he can make a, a tactical adjustment and get himself in front of Vine for the next one and go back into fifth place. Oh, he's sitting at the back of this group for just a moment, trying to recuperate from that sprint. It's an explosive effort that a sprinter's not accustomed to. And the team that he's riding for, the Superior team, they started with the bare minimum. All the other teams have got seven riders. They started with just four riders, and they start today with three because one of them crashed out. Well, starting the race with any less than four, they say, no, you can't start. That's not a team. Yeah, correct. Three's a crowd, not a team. <laughs> <laughs> so fastest lap so far, that belongs to James Whelan, who's got the pink helmet from EF Education First at four minutes and 57 seconds. He knows the loop around here, the tan very well from his days as a middle distance runner. And he spent a fair bit of time on his bike as well, riding alongside the Yarra, making the journey in towards the city. And he's one of the locals, so making the most of riding very much on home soil, not just in his home country, but in his hometown. Well, we see that hot lap of 4.57. That was set, of course, when he was getting into the break, that big acceleration, a sprint to get in there, open up the gap, work really hard together to get a bit of a buffer over the peloton, hence that fastest lap. But I'm sure later on in the race, particularly, I think, the last lap of the race will end up being our hottest lap overall. The big lead-out's going because you have guys like Danese and Groves, our two dominant sprinters of the race. And I think we'll probably see the Mitchelton-Scott team take control of the lead-out 
but they won't have it all their own way. What we've seen the last few days, education first, their timing's been pretty good to get to the front. Maybe not quite spot on to be able to really launch the sprint for Marina Hoffland. The small advantage EF Education First have today is the fact one of their riders, James Whelan, with the pink helmet, is in the breakaway. Therefore, their team doesn't have to chase and they can save all their resources for the lead out for Marino Hoffman. Exactly. And the one guy they have in the break in James Whelan is not one of the riders for the lead out. So it's not like they're going to miss a guy who would normally be there. He doesn't function within that lead out train. So that's a, a good move. Being up there, team, sit back, rest, let the others do all the work, and maybe today is the day they can spring the ambush at the right time, get over the top of Mitchelton Scott. Same goes for Israel Startup Nation. They have a rider in the breaks. In fact, they're not riding on the front of the peloton. That's Catterford that they have in the breakaway. One of four Canadians on that team. The rider that they'll be protecting when it comes down to the sprint finish is Mika Ram, who was third on the longer stage, which was into Wangaratta, 178 kilometres. Number 92 at the back of the group, this is Michael Freeberg. He was sixth, incidentally, on that stage. When Michael Rice finished in fifth position, who's one of the teammates of Michael Freeberg, and Michael Rice was the first of the non-World Tour teams. So World Tour in cycling is Division One. It's the top tier of the sport. And Michael Rice was in fifth position. He was the first rider, not a member of one of those big teams. And he'd spent the day in the breakaway. He wasn't working in the breakaway. So I sent his sports director, one of your old teammates, Hank Vogels, a text message. Hank, what's the strategy? Break's not going to work. We don't want to waste his energy. We need him for the sprint. Hank was right. Pretty good effort dropping back from the break and then getting into the top five. And we often talk about these pro-continental teams, they're that tier below the world tour. There's certainly some fantastic riders and some really talented young riders amongst those teams. And talking about the, the ARA, Sunshine Coast Pro Cycling team, they had a win yesterday in the Tour de Langkawi in Malaysia with Taj Jones, 19 years old. He beat a World Tour pro in Max Valscheid from the NTT team. Who's big and quick and super strong. He is. So that is no mean feat. That is uh, that is a big win for both Taj, Taj Jones and the ARA Sunshine Coast team. Uh, particularly at that age. To beat that quality of field at that age in an international race is impressive. And what these races are great for, like the Tour de Langkawi, the Jaco Herald Sun Tour, as a young rider from a pro continental team is getting yourself on the radar. And certainly Taj Jones has done that already with his win in Lankau because all the big teams, they watch these races, they look at the results, they see who's who. And in this race, I'm sure there are a lot of, a lot of directors and scouts sitting up and taking notice of one young Sebastian Berwick. How do we get a hold of him? He is good. He's still only 21 years of age. He wears the white jersey as the leader of the Visit Victoria Best Young Rider classification. Well, talking of it, how do we get a hold of him? He's spent a couple of seasons racing in France with the AG2R Le Mondial development team. So they've already spotted the talent a couple of years ago. He went over there as a 17-year-old. And to be honest, the first year he, he struggled. He was trying to learn the language. He was trying to learn the racing. He was just a kid who was physically very good, but underpowered compared to the guys he was racing against, but persevered, learned everything he could, kept growing, got stronger. He's still just a, just a kid. He's not even a big kid. But uh, I tell you what, he has come along in leaps and bounds over the last season, and great to see him performing here in the Jaco Herald Sun Tour on those mountaintop finishes. That is really one for the future. He's a kid with big, big potential. 37 seconds, the advantage for the breakaway group. They're working really well together. We're down to 62 kilometres remaining as they make their way around the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. up Anderson Street once again at the front of the group, the rider in the white colours that's Subaki from the Kinan cycling team, the team out of Japan and they ride Yonex bikes whenever I see Yonex I can't help but think of Stan Varenka's backhand <laughs> there's, 
there's many a thing that reminds you of tennis, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> and spot a tennis court from a helicopter shot that's in the far right-hand corner of the screen. I know, sometimes I've just got a duck because you're practising your backhand here in the commentary booth. It's like you with a golf course. They're having a nice conversation. Catafort, it looks smaller than 32 seconds, doesn't it? But Anderson Street is quite steep. It is quite steep and really could be a launching pad. There they are, right, just up in front. But uh, as always... It never looks as steep or as hard on TV as it is in reality. This is interesting. Mark O'Brien is the rider at the front who's doing the chasing. That's for the quarter Mentor Australian national team. Their best sprinter is Godfrey Slattery. And this is a team where every rider except for Mark O'Brien is eligible for the best young rider classification. He's the captain of the team. He lives in Melbourne. He knows this road like the back of his hand. And he wants to give the youngsters on that team a chance at the stage today. Also, the St. George Continental team doing some work there at the front. I thought it may have been Connor Reardon, young man from the Gold Coast, getting a, a great opportunity to ride here in the Jago Herald Sun Tour. Teammate of Sebastian Berwick, but also they've got two good sprinters in Craig Wiggins from Albany in Western Australia and also Ryan Kavanagh, the young fast man from Brisbane. Yeah, Wiggins is really quick. Well, if those two can team up, you know, provide a lead out to one or the other, I think they could be really competitive. Peloton strung out under the guidance of Mark O'Brien for the quarter Mentha Australian national team. He is the rider at the front leading the charge. And now St. George Continental also at the front. They're assisting with the pacemaking. Unfortunately for that team, Craig Wiggins, who we speak of as a fast finisher, he abandoned the race. He was unable to finish stage three, which was into Wangaratta. Oh, there's one I've missed. I'll cross him off. <laughs> Back of the peloton, the yellow colours. That's Charles Etienne Creighton, young Canadian who has spent a lot of time in this race in the breakaways. Just in front of him is Guillaume Bouvant of Israel Startup Nation. Well, there you go. In that case, then, for St. George Continental, the go-to man is Ryan Kavanagh, the man they call Cav. So they should. It's exactly so no surprise, he is a sprinter. Yeah, it's fitting. <laughs> 34 seconds, the advantage for the breakaway group. The peloton not panicked, not overly concerned, still 60 kilometres remaining. Pink colours of the EF Education first team. They're sitting pretty comfortably in that peloton because they have James Whelan in the break. This is the Governor's House that we get a chance to look at as we pan back across the Yarra River and the wonderful bypass that lead all the way in past the Art House and its spire and then the bridge that takes you across from one side of the Yarra to the other. Over the bay, over Port Phillip Bay, the famous boxes down by the beach and through to the Mornington Peninsula with its wonderful wineries. Back live with Gun by World Stage 5 of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. This is the final day. There's a strong breakaway group out in front with riders sitting in fifth and sixth position in the general classification. And they've been fighting for the intermediate sprints to take the bonus seconds. And as it stands at the moment, Jay Vine has moved himself from sixth place up to fifth place. And Jesse Hewitt, unfortunately for him, he slipped from fifth down to sixth. So they've done the swap going back the other way around. Sun Weber at the front controlling the peloton. So too the Mitchelton Scott team. They're thinking not so much about the overall standings in the race for the yellow jersey, which sits on the shoulders of Jai Hindley. They're thinking about their sprinters. Last year, Caden Groves and Alberto Danese. Caden Groves now with Mitchelton Scott. Alberto Danese with Sun Weber. They were teammates together at the SEG racing team one of the key development teams in world cycling. Now they're rivals, they get along well, but they'll be rubbing shoulders in the last couple of kilometres. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> rubbing shoulders and staying up, of course. Love to see a head-to-head -head sprint with the fastest men here. As you said so far, that has proved to be Groves, Danese, Hofland. There's a couple others out there. I'm also looking at not only 
Mikel Ram, the Estonian from Israel Startup Nation, but also Guillaume Boivin, the Canadian, number 31 from that same team. Really good turn of speed. I think maybe the, that punch up Alexander Street will really suit him. And he's ridden well in Australia in the past. He was a medalist at the World Championships in the under-23s back in 2010 when Michael Matthews went out the winner. 36 seconds, the advantage for the breakaway group. Yarra River on the left, the Botanic Gardens off to the right. Up Anderson Street once again, a chance for the riders to go through the feed zone. Is Dom, how's he going with his bidden delivery this time? Perfect. We have had a few conversations about Dom the Swan yet throughout this year's race, Robbie. He's nailed the bidden delivery this time around. Outstanding. James Whelan. Not in the bad break for an osteopath. Not bad. James Whelan, his collection a couple of days ago. Looked like he didn't play enough cricket as a kid. He didn't have the soft hands. This is an attack from Brendan Davids of Oliver's Real Food Racing. He's not happy with the tempo up Anderson Street. He wants to up the ante. Well, maybe he's hoping just this increase in speed will motivate the others and say, this is how we should be doing it. They say you should always lead by example. So he's the manager of this group. Seven riders in the breakaway and they're sweeping around this corner. As you approach this corner, it looks like you kind of need to hit the brakes, but it actually opens up quite wide and you don't need to touch the brakes at all and you really hook on through with plenty of speed. David's after that little attack. Now he has to somehow get this group working once again. James Whelan is prepared to roll on through. He wears the Go Tafe polka dot jersey for the King of the Mountains classification. The actual leader of that competition is Jai Hindley, having won to the top of both Falls Creek and Mount Buller. Catterford going through in the white and blue colours of Israel Startup Nation. This is Jesse Ewart in the blue colours for Sapura. Unfortunately for him, he was third in the first of the intermediate sprints. So he's gone from fifth place overall to sixth place overall, just one second behind. David McKenzie, your roadside, how are you? Oh, I'm very good, Matt, Robbie. I tell you what, the break have just gone past me. I've been listening to you guys. They're working well together, they seem to. I mean, how good is Ben Hill? He's just a phenomenon. He picks the moves, he picks the breaks. But if I look back here, the peloton, well, if we wait long enough, they'll come whizzing past. I've been here for a couple of naps now. They are absolutely flying. They're doing probably 60 kilometres an hour when they come through this section here. But they are going to have to work hard to bring that break back because they've got a pretty good advantage at the moment. And again, I mentioned Ben Hill. Here come the peloton now. They're being led by St George once again. And look at that whoosh as they come past. Good roads. It's a great circuit, as you guys both know. It's super fast. And they will do this whole entire course, I'd imagine, in less than two hours. Thanks, Macca. This is a course that David McKenzie knows well. He actually won the Australian Road Championships around the Botanic Gardens in 1998. And it was the shortest reign as the Australian champion in the history of the National Championships. That was in November. The following year, the National Championships moved to January. And in 1995, the pro title went to a guy by the name of Robbie McEwen. Back in the day when they had a, a pro and an amateur Australian title, I was actually an amateur. I wasn't eligible to have the jersey, but I won the race. Because you were AIS then, yeah? I was in the, the Australian Institute of Sport national team. Uh, second was Herminio diaz Sabala from the Onsay team. team the and third, his teammate at Onsay, one Neil Stevens. So he was crowned Australian pro He was the pro Australian title. pro champion, but, but I you won, won the race. And didn't the race then go over the Westgate Bridge? Yeah, it went over the Westgate, the went out to, out to Lara, somewhere around there. And through the, the Yu-Yangs. Yep, through the Yu-Yangs and then back in along the freeway, back over the Westgate, and that's where the winning move went. Three of us off the front and finished here with four laps of the Botanical Gardens. And was it organised by John Trevorrow? I can't remember. Might have been. I don't know if it was organised by John Trevorrow or well, John, Craven. John Craven. One of the Johns. One of the Johns from Geelong. 42 seconds now, the advantage for the breakaway group. I like the fact that the St George Continental team are assisting with the chase. I do too. And it's it's partly because Seb Berwick is, uh, Berwick, sorry, is uh, sitting there in second overall. But I think they're also going to be giving some morale to Ryan Kavanagh to say, Ryan, 
you can win this. You can be competitive against these guys. And just putting someone on the front, instilling that bit of belief, something like we spoke about with Dave Sanders, with Seb Berwick, last kilometre and a half of Mount Buller. This is where it's going to happen. You will be here. Same sort of thing with a sprinter. You start to ride on the front, control. We believe in you. Yeah. You're going to be there in the mix. That's why we are riding now. This is the breakaway group with Michael Freeberg, number 92, still leading the charge as they're about to make the right-hand turn once again onto Anderson Street. James Whelan, number 17, he currently holds the Herald Sun hot lap with a time of 4 minutes and 57 seconds around this 4.1-kilometre course. Catterford is number 32 for the Israel Startup Nation. That's David's in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing. Brett Dutton, who is the guy who set up the St. George Continental team, he's done a brilliant job with that team. They race quite a lot in Asia. I've been lucky enough to commentate on them in the last couple of years in China at the Tour of Tahu Lake. He made a pretty good call by putting Dave Sanders in the chair for this race because this is Davo's territory. Yeah, it is absolutely his realm, the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Every road throughout Victoria over Dave Sanders' reign as coach of the VIS over the years, and he's coached so many winners in so many different races across the entire country, but particularly here in Victoria. This is Davids at the front. Brendan Davids in the green colours. Jesse Hewitt at the back. Another rider that we see a lot racing throughout Asia. And the Asian circuit, it's underestimated how difficult it is to get results in Asia. Obviously, it's Europe is still... to get a result anyway. Yeah, obviously, Europe is still the pinnacle. But, you know, to win in the United States, to win in South America is incredibly difficult. Likewise in Asia. And to get a win here in Australia is also super, super tough. Whelan leads them through off Alexander Street. This fast right-hander as we come towards the finish. This next right-hander, which brings us on to Birdwood Avenue. A little bit off camera, sort of dip right in the apex there as well. And essential to have your position already locked in when you come onto this final straight. It's just too late to move up. The road dips down, so the speed really picks up. And from about 325 metres to go, the road starts to rise again. It's a real drag up towards the finish and also bending to the right. So positioning is everything. It's quite easy to get blocked in as well. So you see it right there, that right-hand bend through 150 metres to go. As a sprinter, how important will it be each lap, just doing a recon, getting a feel for that approach to the finish line as they come through with it going slightly downhill? I think you've... It gives you an opportunity to pick out what's going to be the ideal position. Uh, obviously, ideal would be with a full lead out with two guys in front of you still with 350 to go. One guy still in front of you with less than 200 to go. And he would swing out to the left and let you go up through the inside. And create a bit of traffic for the others? It create just a wider bend for the others. Somewhat that, you know, they'll have to go around him. So make that, that run in the outside lane is that little bit longer. And that would be the perfect team scenario. You've also got to make sure that someone else doesn't go early from behind and just box you in behind your own teammate. Really hard to get yourself out. You can see the running track just down to the right-hand side. That's the famous lap around what is known as the tan. A good mate of mine once, he was running, and a pregnant woman ran past. And he thought, how on earth am I getting passed by a pregnant woman? He tried to keep up, and he couldn't keep up. And later on, he found out that it was Lisa Ondiecki. <laughs> Well, one of our best ever female marathon runners. For those who don't know who Lisa Ondiecki is, no shame in that. No, he was delighted to find out that it was Lisa Ondiecki. Or maybe just made up it was her because he's... <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody out for a jog today. Peloton still moving along reasonably quickly, but they're not full throttle yet because that gap at 42, 43 seconds, it's been stable for quite a while. Not full throttle, but look at the shape of that Peloton. Almost in complete single file. A few twos and threes here and there. But uh, a lot of riders just lined out behind each other. Back up to the break. And they most definitely lined out behind each other. This is Subaki at the back of the group. They're really giving it to it at the moment in this breakaway because it's a relatively short stage of just on 86 kilometres. But you can see how hard they're working by the occasional disruption within the group. Yeah, it's just not going smoothly up here. There's riders missing turns, hanging back a little bit. So we don't see that really nice, smooth, looping chain, as it were, working as a group. Michael Freeberg just trying to get them organised again. A little bit of talking still going on at the front as well. 
and they will know that they're never really going to get given more than 40, 45 seconds. Nice picnic in the park on the side. They've got the electric barbecues on the side of the Yarra River. You can stop on the bike. The tennis centre is still back oh, on the, the tennis center. Hang Calm on. down, Kino. Well, John Kane passed away recently. He was the Premier of Victoria in the early 1980s. And he was the one that moved the Australian Open from Kuyong to develop what was then known as Flinders Park. It's now Melbourne Park and Rod Laver Arena. And the Northcote Velodrome, that's called John Kane Memorial Park, which is after his father, where the velodrome was for Northcote Velodrome. They're now renaming the multi-purpose venue there, which has got the velodrome in it, to the John Kane Arena. So the two main velodromes in Victoria are named after the two John Canes, both former premiers of Victoria. Well, it might be a little bit difficult when they say racing's on at John Kane. Which one do you turn up to, That's senior true. or junior? We have our seven leaders. Michael this Freeberg here at the back. It's a fair bit of discussion within this group, Robbie. And Ben Hill is no longer in this group. So he secured that green jersey for the Brightbury points classification. So he's dropped back to the main peloton. And perhaps now he's thinking about a different way to try and win the stage, either for himself or with his team. I think that's a good tactical decision. He's gone out there. He's got the job done. He knows he's wrapped that jersey up. And you know, with a gap that's never been more than 45 seconds and knowing which teams are chasing behind, why not back yourself and say, I've got this job done, mission accomplished. Now I'm going to go and take them on in the sprint. I'm going to see what I can do in a full bunch sprint against these World Tour pros. They make Either that or he's just completely exhausted. <laughs> It could be both. He's been in every break. He has, absolutely. His classic strategy, I'll find the right break. I'll go in all of them. Maybe he cramped. <laughs> Again, <laughs> he cramps a lot and he tries, he's tried every trick in the book to try and work out what it is, deliberately trying to get himself to cramp out training to the point of going out training just using pickle juice. I'm not sure how that was meant to work. Lexus of Blackburn providing the vehicles for this race. Had the privilege of being able to drive one throughout the race. Fantastic. I like the Bora Hansgrohe jersey off to the side as well. The team of Peter Sagan, one of the most popular cyclists on the planet. Mark O'Brien, he's not just chasing or not just leading that peloton to try and chase down the breakaway. He's trying to go across on his own. Well, maybe that's what he was all about. He was involved in the chase. He was riding tempo on the front, maybe just to get himself close enough so he could then try and jump across the gap. A little bit of a curious one. 33 seconds is... That's no easy gap to cross with six riders who are still swapping off. Particularly on your own, when you know in the peloton that there's two big World Tour teams, Mitchelton Scott and Sunweb, who are dictating terms. I just think it's how Mark O'Brien is wired. He loves to be on the attack. He would have been disappointed that he missed getting in the breakaway, I guess. So what else is he going to do? He could just ride on the front and neutralise the break. He'd much rather go up there and assist them. So hard to escape the peloton when there are World Tour teams in the race who are determined to make it a bunch sprint. Yeah. And you see, they haven't panicked either. They've watched him go and thought, off you go, we'll wind you back in later. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. And what about the Israel Cycling Academy team? They've got a rider in the breakaway, but a potential stage winner for the sprint, Mikhail Ram, still sitting back in the peloton. Oh, I think they'll still be really relaxed about the situation. It's now back out to 45 seconds, so the intensity gone up somewhat in the breakaway, so that gap building all the time. But you look back in the peloton, it's just controlled pacemaking. No reason for anyone to panic. This is Rob Power from the Sunweb team leading through. Connor Reardon on his wheel. The Sunweb team is almost 50% Western Australian. Jai Himley, Michael Storer and Rob Power. And then we've got the current Australian road champion in the race, who is from Western Australia. The current Australian time trial champion is the Western Australian Luke Durbridge. And the Criterium champion is West Australian. And last year's Australian road champion is in the peloton in Freeburg. From Western Australia. What's is West the... is best. What's in the water? Big sharks. <laughs> Big sharks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell you what, they, they do run you know, very good grassroots programs over there. Really great clubs. Lots of really good quality racing. And... Honestly, Western Australia is one of the states who isn't struggling as much as the other states to organise road racing. 
uh, the, one of the big struggles trying to organise road racing is closing roads, traffic management, the costs of doing that, the insurance implications. In Western Australia, they have a lot of shires which are much more accommodating. Um, they have some decent sponsorship, but that's not all. But they have passionate clubs, people who run them, organise the races, but they get out hundreds of kilometres from Perth to, to run road races. And one of the best is down at Margaret River. The Tour of Margaret River is one of those exceptional national events. In fact, not just, a say, an NRS National Road Series event, but it's a, a club teams event. They race each other across all divisions. There's A grade through K grade. K grade. And it, it is unreal. It is a super event down there in Margaret River. And one of the best parts is a recovery post-stage. You're in one of the best wine regions in I, Australia as well. It's magnificent. This is Angus Lyons at the back in the green colours from Oliver's Real Food Racing. He's been really active throughout the race, but this is not the sort of circuit for Angus. He likes the climbs. One of the boys from Ballarat. Well, these riders on their way back from uh, Mount Buller yesterday, they could have stopped off in the Yarra Valley on the way through. It was a beautiful spot to stop. And it's only about a 45 minute drive from the heart of Melbourne. Great training territory and plenty of the riders in this race such as number 11 in the pink colors there mitch docker he spends a fair bit of his time out there training number 16 the pink colors as well that's tom scully he'll be really important in the lead out for marino hoffland from that team yep this the man they call the scud he's the one that gets them on the rails and try to launch marino hoffland to get him a stage win the white jersey, we just saw him momentarily. A little bit more picnic action off to the left-hand side of the road. The white jersey, visit Victoria Best Young Rider. That is Seb Berwick. The group is trying to be cohesive, but the tempo's so high, it's looking a little disrupted. Mark O'Brien is still stuck somewhere in the middle. Yeah, O'Brien at 26 seconds behind this group and some 13 seconds ahead of the peloton. And that is officially what's known as no man's land. And straight there, you can see the path with the bike paint on it. You can go straight across the bridge there and then onto a bike path. And you turn right and you go out towards the eastern suburbs left and it's an easy trip into the city. And there's Mark O'Brien. Well, he'll be happy to be on the hill and see them reaching across and taking bidons. And he'll be thinking, I can nip a few more seconds off them along here. And he'll really struggle once he turns onto Birdwood Avenue. And there's the peloton already, see? So He's still closer to the peloton than he is to the break. Not yet halfway across. I can almost feel his pain as he makes his way up this climb. It's a perfect road surface. See the colours on the right-hand side, the dark blue? That is the new Kiwi team. That's the Black Spoke Racing team. And this is its first season in the peloton. And their team owner, the Thunder, he's been out here for the last 48 hours watching them in action. Yep, the new Kiwi team launched this year. Rode their first official race in New Zealand, the New Zealand Classic, and won a stage. Straight up, first day with Aaron Gate. Yeah, he's quick, Aaron Gate. He's, he's a good bike rider, Aaron Gate. He's unlucky not to be at that next level in a World Tour team. And this is an impressive performance, almost across to Mark O'Brien in one ascent of Anderson Street. Well, there's a huge acceleration. That's the number 137 of Ari Scott, the Kiwi from Black Spoke. And he is about to make contact with Mark O'Brien. Two is better than one. O'Brien will be happy for the company. He's one of the youngsters on the team. David McKenzie's had a little bit to do with this team because Scott Guyton, who's the team sports director, is a former teammate of David McKenzie. So David McKenzie's got a lot of experience having run his own team, the I-Team Nova squad. So Scott Guyton has seeked a little bit of advice from David McKenzie. So David's slightly biased towards watching these guys. And why not? Rightly so, I think. I wonder if Mark O'Brien is using this as preparation to get ready for the Melbourne to Warnable next weekend. The summer of cycling is not over yet. One of our biggest classics on the calendar, the Melbourne to Warnable. Michael Freeberg at the back of the group. He'd be a real contender for that race. It would suit him. Big diesel engine. He can go all day. 
Well, you've got to be able to go all day. It's nearly 300 kilometres long. Great race. In fact, what is the, the kilometre count at the moment for this year? Any idea? I, I remember when I did it, we left from uh, Federation Square over Westgate. Race went live shortly after that, but it was a 300-kilometre day. Yeah, it's slightly shorter than that now, but not too far off it. 43.5 kilometres remaining in the Gumbire World Stage 5, the final day of racing in the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Pan out over the Sydney My Music Bowl where they have the Christmas carols, the tennis centre in the background, so too the MCG and the new football stadium that you can see on the right hand side. And this is the Eureka Tower, which is the highest building in Melbourne, the Art Spire just to the other side. And I think the Eureka Tower, Robbie, it might be about to get surpassed. Yeah, it might get overtaken there with the building on the right. <laughs> Oh, and, uh, see bird's eye view of the circuit here around the botanical gardens. There is our peloton. A lot of red at the front. Sunweb, but also joined at the front by the St. George Continental team. I love the attitude of that team. They're ready to take on the World Tour squads, no problem. They, at the tour of uh, Taihu Lake last year, they managed to win the race overall, courtesy of the Kiwi, Dylan Kennett. And there were four teams in that race. Between them, they'd ridden the Giro, the Tour, and the Vuelta. And they said, yeah, sure, you can ride those races. Doesn't mean you can beat us. Uh, certainly in this race at the Jayco Herald Sun Tour with Dave Sanders behind the wheel in the team car as director sportive. He's the sort of man who can make his team believe you're not five foot tall, you're seven foot tall. <laughs> you belong. Not only do you belong, you can win. Nice cruise along the Yarra River. Beautiful day for it. Temperature in the mid-20s, the peloton charging along. St. George Continental setting the tempo at the front, sharing the pace making with Sunweb and the Mitchelton Scott team. This is the breakaway group, Israel Cycling Academy, number 32, that's Alexander Catterford, a team with a chance to win the stage today with Mikael Ram. Ram was in third position on the stage into Wangaratta. Fair bit of conversation still happening. Number 57, that's Jesse Ewart. He needs to win the next intermediate sprint to get the three-second time bonus to move himself back up to fifth place overall. He's currently in sixth position. The man who's in front of him sits at the back of this group, Jay Vine, in the whites and purple colours of Nero Continental. Forty seconds now. Their advantage over the peloton. The two chasers in the middle. It's Ari Scott of Black Spoke and uh, Mike Mark O'Brien of Quarter Mentha. There they are. They've just rounded the corner. You can almost reach out and grab them, yeah, but it's not that by Another five or six seconds, I think. It says 25 still, but they look to be a little bit closer for mine. And Ari Scott is opening up the throttle. He knows they need to close it down quickly. They can't gradually get across. They really need to bridge this gap in a hurry. Well, they're still just holding that slight gap over the peloton. So they have closed it down a little bit as well. Peloton at 38. So they're still just the whole time hovering at 13 seconds ahead of the peloton. But it's been a good mark of the peloton. Just thinking, we'll just pace ourselves off that. And narrowing the gap of this group right here. Jesse Hewitt rolls on through in the blue colours. He's riding a huge gear, followed by Michael Freeberg. 37 seconds, their advantage. Port Phillip Bay, then the journey back into Melbourne, across the top of the Shrine of Remembrance, and the exhibition buildings where the first Australian Parliament was held up to Federation in 1901. Federation Square right next door to the famous laneways and the eateries, and the beautiful journey down the Great Ocean Road, which take you all the way through to the Twelve Apostles.
Gun by World Stage 5 of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. They're down to the closing eight laps of this stage. Jai Himley wears the yellow jersey as the overall race leader. He's not being challenged for his position to win this race overall. He has a 10-second buffer over second place in the general classification, which is Seb Berwick. Third place, that is Damien Howes, and he's more than 30 seconds behind. This Robbie McEwen is one of your favourites. It will be a battle surely between the sprinters if or once they reel this breakaway in. I would give it a 99% chance. It'll be a battle amongst the sprinters, but never discount someone trying to jump away up Alexander Street. That hill that takes them through one kilometre to go. And as a sprinter, you've got to be aware of that as well. You focus on your job, but always remember a plan B. You've got to be on the ball if someone goes. If you consider that to be someone serious enough, you need to make the move and go. Do something different, not get caught out. Number 92, Michael Freeberg. 12 months ago, the odds were firmly stacked against him winning the Australian road title. What did he do? He, he went won. out and won it anyway. So, he could possibly upset the apple cart this afternoon. If anybody from this group can do it, it's Michael Freeberg. Yeah, I would think he's the man with the best credentials to be able to hold off a chasing peloton. I just don't think it's going to be for today. I think there's just so much control back behind. Mitchelton Scott, they know they've got a proven winner in Caden Groves. Sunweb, they know that Danese can win, but they're also looking after Jai Hindley. I don't think they'll be able to form the lead-out train. I, th I th would put my money if it was going anywhere on Caden Groves. I don't think Mitchelton Scott are going to let the opportunity slip away. I think Mitchelton Scott would be a little frustrated with the race that they've had. They had high hopes for Simon Yates. Damien Housen did a great job to try and step up. He sits in third position. They've had one stage win with Caden Groves. That gives them a fair bit to smile about, the young sprinter that's been recruited to the team. And importantly, the team's general manager, Shane Bannon, is here today. He hasn't been here throughout the summer, but he's here today for this final stage. So they'll be hoping to impress, no doubt. Jesse Hewitt in the blue colours rolls through. Number 32, that's Alexander Catterford. 102, that's Brendan Davids from Oliver's Real Food Racing. 124 is Jay Vine. Fantastic climber, Jay Vine. Number 86, that is Hiroshi Subaki. Jesse Hewitt in the blue. And number 92 is Michael Freeberg. And there's the cruise down the Yarra. It's a pleasant way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Now, I, th I think it's going to be a really tight battle to nail the lead out between Mitchelton Scott and EF Pro Cycling. Now, from this angle, you can see how big the gap is. Ari Scott at the front, Mark O'Brien at the back. It looks so much shorter on Anderson Street. Along here at these speeds, it looks big. And it looks like the breeze is against them along this section as well. It's not a windy day, but judging by the speed they're riding at on this flat section along the river, the, it is definitely a breeze into the face. They're making it tough for these two riders to try and get across. And as I was just saying, for the lead out and the battle I think we're going to see between the sprinters' teams, for Mitchelton Scott, they've got pretty good numbers to get involved in a, in a lead out. Guys with that, that high speed capability, Bewley, Schultz, Meyer and Dion Smith to lead out Caden Groves. But on the other hand, from education first, a guy like Mitch Docker, along with Tom Scully and the young German who you wouldn't have seen much of. Jonas, Jonas. Rutsch. You saw him at the Tour Down I Under? I saw him at the Tour Down Under. Do you like it? Really versatile, big, strong rider. Not only a decent climber, but a good time trust, but a guy with a decent turn of speed as well. And I think he'll be the man to pull uh, Docker and Scully into position before they take over and up and over this final hill. I think we'll be talking about him for a long time to come, particularly in races like gent Wavelgum, Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. Our leaders... And it doesn't it look so much shorter from this angle, the gap for Mark O'Brien and Ari Scott chasing. They're edging closer and closer every lap. So, so the peloton. The peloton. <laughs> and now this is Bridge Lane that have come to the front. That's the team of Ben Hill who has secured the Bright Brewery points classification. You're trying to work out their options, aren't you? Yeah, and I think their option is Ben Hill. Yeah, because Nick White's no longer in the race. Nick White, day one, he crashed and he picked himself up and said, no, I'm OK, I can finish. Looked like he just had a bit of skin off his right hip. 
two broken ribs and a punctured lung, and he rode the final 80 kilometres. And then said, I'm OK. <laughs> and the doctor said, no, you're not. He wasn't able to start the second stage. Mark O'Brien for quarter Mentha, the Australian national team, followed then by Ari Scott. Here's the leading group as they sweep through the bend once again. 37 kilometres remaining. Still working really well together. The rider in the blue colours, Jesse Hewitt, is really hoping they at least survive to the next of the intermediate sprints so he can collect a three-second time bonus and get himself back into the position where he started the day, fifth place overall. Well, that'll be, I think, at the end of the next lap. They should get a whistle shortly. End of lap 15. So with seven to go. Ignore the cowbells. You can hear being rung there by the spectators in encouragement. In fact, nine laps nine to go. Oh, so it's another couple of another laps couple until of laps we get the sprint. Another two laps. Another two yeah. laps. And Mark O'Brien and Ari Scott have really stabilised. They're not making enough progress. This, The numbers are against them out in front. Yeah, well, they're creeping up 13 seconds, the gap, but it seems they, they fall behind through this section down towards the Yarra and then along the Yarra into that little headwind breeze. They seem to lose a little bit of ground there, then make it up again on the climb. 43 seconds, the advantage for the breakaway group ahead of the peloton. And it's this section where the two on their own are at a major disadvantage. Whereas that leading group, they're all working well together. And it is 30% easier sitting in the slipstream on a flat stretch of road than it is when you're the rider on the front. So if you can get more of a break from being the guy in front, that group can go a lot quicker. And of course, if you're in a group of six, the further back you go, in the long, go along in the line, it gets even easier again. 30% for the first man, and just add a couple as you go along the line. That's why we sometimes see riders on the front of the peloton, they are riding virtually as hard as they can, time trial pace, where you look further back in the peloton and see guys freewheeling. And that's why at the front of the peloton at the moment, the teams that are doing the chasing, they're each just using one rider, and that's a rider that won't be part of the lead-out train for the sprinters. So they'll be sitting a little bit further back, saving their energy, waiting for the big burst in the last few laps, particularly that final lap. And I can't wait for the last right-hand turn onto the climb of Anderson Street. Jay Vine is at the front of the group for the Narrow Continental team. What has been impressive throughout this year's Jaco Herald Sun Tour is the standard of the domestic teams. The teams that we see throughout the Australian National Road Series, such as Narrow Continental, St George Continental and also Team Bridge Lane, they have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the World Tour teams. And I, I think over the last few years what the difference has been is that these national-based teams have been able to go and compete in the US and throughout on the on the Asian tour and do a little bit of racing here and there in Europe. Their level has come right up and they know what to expect coming into races like this against World Tour teams and they've built a lot more confidence as well. So they are really forces to be reckoned with. They're not far away from making the right-hand turn onto the Anderson Street Hill, which David McKenzie knows well. This is the iconic Anderson Street. And normally, for any other day of the year, it's reserved for walkers, joggers, even cyclists, just your casual ones, testing themselves up this great hill. But today, it's reserved for the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. You might not think it's that long. Take a look down. It's about five to 600 metres, bottom to top, 22 times. I guarantee you, the very last lap will be the toughest. It's always the toughest the last time. That fatigue has mounted. And if you miss the Lexus of Blackburn at Herald Sun Tour, the women's race, the final climb to the top of Falls Creek, a 30-kilometre climb, and Robbie, the yellow jersey, Alina Sierra, she held on for 29.5 of those kilometres. She got dropped inside the last 500 metres. It was heartbreaking for her. Yep, always is that last little bit that's the hardest because that's where they give out the prizes. <laughs> Here's our breakaway group. Jay Vine on the right-hand side of the screen in the white and purple colours of Narrow Continental. And you think of, you know, this tempo they're riding now while they're out there in the break compared to what you will see the last time up. 
as the sprint lead outs are trying to keep things together and launch their man and it will be full sprint up and over the top and you'll see i think like we have in the past when we finished here you see a couple of sprinters they look like they're in the mix they're one of the favorites for a, a podium position and they absolutely explode on this 500 meter long section because it is really quite tough the heart rate is already redlining and not only that you've got to get over the top of this couple of quick deep breaths and you're into the sprint already so it's a it's a two for the price of one and for the sprinter that is the strong sprinter as opposed to the pure flatland sprinter make the most of the hill to try and take the sting out of the tail of the others yeah if you're not that pure sprinter but one of the more strong men who's quite fast you want it to be as hard as possible up and over the top of alexander street really have the pressure on the sprinters try and build that lactic acid and you see that breeze there just through the trees and that flying flag from education first is quite a stiff breeze coming through it looks like it's a tailwind finish as well that'll en enable riders to just set off that little bit earlier in the sprint this is james willen at the front he's got the go tafer king of the mountains jersey on he's been in big breakaways throughout this race this is his first serious race for the season. It's his second season in the World Tour. And every rider that makes their debut in the World Tour, they get a two-year contract first up. That's one of the rules of the UCI. They're about to get the whistle for the second of the intermediate sprints. So this is a really important season for the rider with the pink helmet on, James Williams. Well, they will stay clear to fight out the next one without Ben Hill this time. So we'll see that battle now without the influence of Hill you know, doing what we knew he was going to do. It'll become a much more tactical battle between uh, Vine and Hewitt. This is Mark O'Brien up the climb of Anderson Street. He's got Ari Scott on the ropes. He needs to keep Ari Scott with him so they can work around the rest of the circuit. Well, better to have two than one to work around this circuit. <laughs> O'Brien really with the pressure on up that hill. But for mine, they look pretty evenly matched as a duo. But this group working very smooth together and just purely the numbers. Seven riders up here. So the two riders holding. to watch, particularly on this lap, the rider in third position with predominantly white colours on, that is Jay Vine, and the rider in the blue colours from the Sapura team, that is Jesse Hewitt. They're battling for fifth place overall. It's one second that separates them at the moment. The rider in the white, Jay Vine, is currently in fifth place overall. In blue, Jesse Hewitt is in sixth place overall. If Jesse can win this sprint, he moves back up into fifth place. And last time through, Ben Hill, he set a rhythm to the sprint. He's not here now. The others aren't interested in this intermediate sprint, only those two. Yeah, now we should see a real head-to-head -head battle between those two riders because Ben Hill had a really big influence on the last sprint. He rode his own sprint, but he dragged Jay Vine in his slipstream into second place. And it looked like you would have done everything right. He got the position. He was on Ben Hill's wheel, but when he went, he simply could not hold it, opened a gap up of just over a bike length, and by that time, already underway trying to accelerate was Jay Vine. He slotted straight in, said, thank you very much. I'm up into fifth. I'm looking forward to how they go about this one without Ben Hill with them. Whether one thinks of the other, oh, I might be able to just get away from him up this hill and spring a surprise, or if we'll see the full uh, non-sprinters sprinting against each other for the bonuses. Oh, this is going to be intriguing. They're real climbers, Jesse Hewitt and Jay Vine. So sprinting is not something that they will have a lot of practice at or do a lot of time training for. It's just not their natural inclination. But this is something I always say to young riders. So any young riders tuning in and watching this, OK, you might not think you're a sprinter. You may not be a sprinter at all. But I ask young riders, how often do you come to the finish solo? Oh, never. So you always need to beat someone else at the finish to win. Yes. Do you ever do any sprint training? No, I'm a climber. I'll go back to my original question. You need to do some form of sprint training. It doesn't matter if you're not fast. Do some sprint training because then you'll know you've done at least what you can to improve what you're not good at. Because if you want to win a race, chances are you're always going to need to beat someone. Solo finishes are very, very rare.
advice from one of the greatest sprinters of his generation, Robbie McKeown, a 12-time stage winner at the Tour de France. There are two chases that looks as if uh, O'Brien and Scott are on the brink of surrendering back to the peloton, which would probably be a wise move. OK, so the junior riders or the coaches out there saying, OK, what do they do then? Once a week, minimum, during your training, go out and do some sprint intervals, six 200-metre sprints with a couple of minutes rest in between them. That's all you need to do. It will really improve your finish. So the rider in the blue colours, Jesse Hewitt, he's looking to try and get himself positioned somewhere near Jay Vine and perhaps catch him by surprise. Well, the pace has really gone out of this group now. They're manoeuvring. Jesse Hewitt dropping his way back. He's looking for Vine. Vine's now at the front. And Jay is looking for Jesse. He's ch checking across the shoulder. He really is trying to keep his eye on the rider in the blue colours. Who's going to the back. I think he's going to launch a little attack here. Well, let's see who tries to sit on who. Number 57 at the back here. That's Hewitt. He's the man currently in sixth overall. Number one, two, four. That is Vine. So Vine sitting further to the front. He's in second wheel now behind Davids of Oliver's Real Food Racing. He's just checking over his shoulder all the time, Vine. Check on the whereabouts of Hewitt, who's That's staying in back. last position at the moment. That Quite is a surprise. A long, long way back. This is perfect at the moment for Jay Vine, who's in second position. Jesse Hewitt is laying off trying to get a run up, but it's really quick from here. Well, Vine's going to find himself in the front. And he goes. He's already going because he sees Ewart is all the way at the back. So he'll just make his sprint from here. He has really caught Ewart out. And as long... I think Ewart said that that's it. Or, or not. He's trying to He's come make now his in the run. blue colours. He's trying to take a run at him. But Jay Vine keeps checking across the shoulder. This has been a smart ride by Jay Vine. Jesse Ewart is trying, but it's all too late. Jay Vine is securing fifth place in the general classification with another time bonus. So he is now two seconds clear. Oh, well done, Jay Vine. Well seen. And Jesse Ewart, he just simply outsmarted himself. Thought he'd sit back and ambush. But Vine, he was acutely aware of where Jesse Hewitt was. As soon as he swung out of that corner, yes, it was 500 metres to go, but he took the opportunity with both hands and said, see you later. Now it will take the experienced member of this breakaway, Michael Freeberg, the tall rider from ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast, to get them reorganised. At Jay Vine, Robbie, just kept checking on the whereabouts of Jesse yeah, Hewitt. Head on a swivel, never just letting go of where Hewitt was keeping an eye all the way through. A good ride by Jay Vine and a well-deserved fifth place overall. It will be a sixth overall at the end of the day for Jesse Ewart. Oh, this is the quarter meant the Australian team and this is not Mark O'Brien. This is the rest of the peloton. A few of the teammates of Jay Vine sitting down towards the back of the group. This is the back of the peloton. But we see those time gaps up the top. So Mark O'Brien... He's been out there for a while. He's at 27 seconds, along with Ari Scott. And as Matt just said, another of the quarter Mentha national team riders somewhere off the front of the peloton, trying to make his way across. I've got some good news for you, Robbie. The Melbourne to Warrnambool, 268 kilometres. Oh, is that all? To mere breeze <laughs> now. 27.3 k's remaining in the fifth stage of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour, presented by Gumbire World. So the sprints have been contested, the intermediate sprint, the Bright Brewery points classification, that zone up for Ben Hill. Fifth place overall at this stage. It looks as if Jay Vine has that all sewn up unless something remarkable happens in the closing stages of this race for Jesse Hewitt. Another attempt from the quarter Mentha team to try and bridge across to that leading group. The rider who's trying to come across, this looks like Callum White. It is Callum White who's trying to go across on his own. He dearly loves some company. Well, we talked about the, the presence of Godfrey Slattery. Their, their man from the quarter meant the team would be the fastest in a, in a sprint finish. But they're throwing everything at it with the rest of the team. So the rest of the team predominantly made up of climbers, opportunists to get in breakaway. So they're just trying to make sure they've got guys up the road. If it does come back together, which I believe it will, and Slattery will have to find his own way to the front. Now, Jesse Hewitt in the blue colours, he's letting go of the breakaway. So too is Sabuki. Sabaki, they're 
saying, oh, well, this break's not going to work. And Jesse, he, he'd have to be disappointed, would he? Starting the day in fifth position, slipping to six, it doesn't sound like a lot, but psychologically it must be a bit of a letdown. Yeah, well, he did what he had to do, being out there with Vine and defending his position. At the end of the day, Vine was just the better man. In the first one, he was faster. In the second one, he just completely outsmarted Jesse Hewitt. Number 17, that is James Whelan, EF Education First. Number 92, that is Michael Freeberg. 102 in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing, Brendan Davids. Number 32 for the Israel Startup Nation, that's Alexander Catterford. And it looks like there's a bit of a game being played at the back here because Jesse Hewitt is back on board with the breakaway. Yep, Tsubaki, he comes back up too, the Japanese rider from the Kinan Cycling Team. And James Whelan, he leads them onto the Alexander Street climb yet again. And at the back, you can see Jesse Hewitt looking behind him a lot at Tsubaki. It looks like the, the Japanese rider is no longer contributing to the work in this breakaway. Drinks on offer yet again. And the gap down to just 29 seconds. And the peloton hasn't even really opened up the throttle in terms of the chase. Our first chaser, that is White. young Callan White from the quarter mentor team. The other two have dropped back, Mark O'Brien and Ari Scott. So they keep trying to get across the quarter mentor national team. Just 14 seconds behind, but the peloton also starting to close in with just 25 kilometres to go. Another six laps when they come through the next time. Vigorous applause on the left-hand side of the road. SRAM neutral service. The car's been provided by Lexus of Blackburn. And the people that you can see in the yellow tops, our volunteers, and this event not possible without the volunteers. They are crucial to supporting events such as this one. 25 kilometres remaining. The high country is now really renowned as the destination for cycling. Having grown up in the area, did you always have that threat of fire and were well aware of it? This summer we've had horrific bushfires and having people come back and it'll be good to see the trails getting filled up and the roads getting filled up with cyclists again. You and I have had fortune ride all over the world and this matches anything I've done. Couldn't agree more. I mean, we're so spoilt with the vineyards, the mountain views, it's just magic. So the ride that we've done today, that's a road ride that I know pretty well. But you're famous for being a world champion on the mountain bike. You've got to take me off road. Yes, we've got Mystic Mountain Bike Park here and then six other amazing locations. This is one of my favourite destinations. I'm coming back in Easter. Hopefully lots of other people come back as well and support the locals. Cheers, mate. Well, the high country, Rob, it's a fantastic place to ride. Really tough place to race. A very tough place to race. I know that I've uh, raced, I think, more than enough times in the high country. Places like Buffalo, Buller, Mount Hotham. Ouch. And uh, well, my favourite way to visit them now is in the winter when there's snow on top. I love getting up to Mount Hotham and going snowboarding with the family. Well, our breakaway group, they've got all that behind them. They've been up to Falls Creek. They've been up to Mount Buller. It's now the Botanic Gardens. It's the Gumbire World Stage 5 of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. We are inside the last 25 kilometres. Their maximum lead has only ever been out to 45 seconds. The Peloton with World Tour teams on the front, they're toying with this breakaway. They are. They know they've got them under control. And immediately that this break moved away, the team of the leader... Jai Hindley, his Sunweb team, they went to the front just keeping things controlled and then they were joined pretty quickly by Education First, also Mitchelton Scott and St George Continental team. So just defending their riders' positions in the overall and just keeping things nice and tight and close for the expected big bunch finish here around the Botanical Gardens. Israel Startup Nation, they have Alexander Catterford in the breakaway. They've got Mikel Ram, a sprinter, back in the bunch. And Boivin who's strong, but I think it will be Mikael Ram who does the sprint for them. And in terms of the team structure, 
outside of the riders. They've got Eric Van Lanker calling the shots in the team car. Brilliant cyclist in his own right. Plus, they've got Greg Henderson working with the team, who was an outstanding lead-out rider for Andre Greipel. They're starting to get everything lined up, this team, and have really earned their spot in the World Tour and can make a big impact. They can, and I hope they do make a big impact in the, in the World Tour. I mean, I'd love to see Andre Greipel get somewhere back near his best. Of course, he's a, now the veteran of the peloton. He's 37 years old. And you can honestly say you know, his best is realistically behind him. But he's still going to have those days where he's near his very best. Uh, he used to win races when he was only 80%. That's how good he is. <laughs> so I, I still think Andre Greipel can win some important races. I think a guy like Andre Greipel on that team can have a massive impact without winning by demonstrating, particularly to the young guys, how you go about it. Well, sharing that just his vast experience in the World Tour Peloton, winning at the highest level, passing that on to, to other riders, and you know, hopefully that can help someone, one of the younger riders in the team, really develop, gain some confidence of riding with Andre Greipel, learn everything he has to offer. Number 14, that's Nielsen Paulus. He's been quiet, but he's in fourth place overall. He's just gone about his business. The young American, 23 years of age, he's been very impressive. He's had a pretty good summer. He rode the tour down under. He did the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, and he winds out his Australian summer here at the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Yeah, and what a fantastic summer of cycling it is here in Australia. Feels like a grand tour. Two, from, two major stage races. From the 3rd of January with the Bay Crits into the Nationals, into the Tour Down Under, across to the Kid Elevens Great Ocean Road Race, and then to the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. And topped off by the Melbourne to Warrnambool next week. Next week. So hopefully we can get more and more teams to extend this. Obviously, you've got to think of the riders. They, they turn up, the World Tour riders, they turn up a couple of weeks before the Tour Down Under. Uh, for the Australians, well, all the better. The more they can ride here, the, the more they love it. Roman can, Bardet, yeah. King of the Mountains from the Tour de France, arrived before New Year's Eve. Yeah, three weeks before the Tour Down Under. There's the green jersey for the Bright Brewery at points classification. Ben Hill, he's got that secured. Bit more movement at the front now. These are no longer moves to try and catch the breakaway. These are moves to create a fresh breakaway. Yeah, these are trying to get away off the front. Another one of the quarter Mentha riders, the young Australian national team. But now these moves being tracked, Rob Power from Sunweb, he accelerated to cover that move because it was also a rider of Education First that was going up the road. So the pace definitely increasing now, just over 20 kilometres left to race. 137, that is Ari Scott. He was the rider who was trying to go across to the break with Mark O'Brien. He's now paying the price. Here's Rob Power on the front for Sunweb. Looks like Aiden Tuvey just behind him from Team Bridge Lane. Connor Reardon still up there, the young Gold Coaster in third wheel. So really good job from him riding on the front, supporting Seb Berwick and also Ryan Kavanagh. What a great race they've had. Of the whole team, St. George Continental, they've been outstanding. I wonder where Brett Dutton is watching this from. He's the team manager. He's the guy who pulls it all together. Probably the VIP area. <laughs> Hopefully deserves it. <laughs> all from the passenger seat of the team car. This is Rob Power now at the front. Yellow jersey of Jai Hindley. He's spoken about his desire to win this race and join the honour roll that includes Bradley Wiggins, Chris Froome, Esteban Chavez, Cameron Meyer, Simon Gerrans. It's impressive. It really is. I mean, all you've got to do is take one look through the results of this race over the years. Quarter meant of the white colours. Mark O'Brien now at the front having the conversation with Carter Turnbull. Uh, any professional worth his salt would love to be uh, up on that list with the former winners of this race. And now it's the rider from WA, the big figure of Michael Freeberg. He knows that the tempo has increased from the peloton, so he's trying to up the ante within this breakaway group. It's pretty tough to do that when you've already been out in front for just about 60 kilometres. Well, here at the back, David swings across, leaves the gap open. Freeberg comes in and fills it. So David's not really contributing with everything he's got. Maybe starting to feel the pinch after being out there for the last uh, hour and a half. St. George Continental now sending an extra rider up to the front. Alex Heaney, the Kiwi on the team, moving up towards the front. They've got real confidence in Ryan Kavanagh. Also, there'll be 
positioning Seb Berwick up near the front. And let's not forget, you can still lose time on this stage. Or gain time. Or gain time. If you lose the wheel, if there's a split and you're behind it, and this is a race of seconds. Well, you he's say Jai, Jai Hindley, he's got a 10-second margin. It's 10-second time bonus to win the stage. It's a 10-second time bonus, but also if a gap opens up, 10 seconds ticks by really, really quickly because you only have to be a second off the rider in front of you. They'll say that is the gap, but then the time is calculated from the first rider who's hit the finish line. So if that's a group of 50 riders and then you're a second off, well, that first rider's crossed the line. By the time you get there, that's going to be a good 10 seconds can happen pretty quickly. The breakaway group still working well together. This is Brendan Davids in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing. The message is then, hold the wheel. <laughs> Subaki at the front, the Japanese rider for the Kinan cycling team. David's not looking uncomfortable, but he's been missing quite a few turns. I just wonder if he's starting to think, I'm going to try and leave this group and go, go solo later on. I don't think they're really believing in their chances with just a 24-second gap, still with over 18 kilometres to go. He is starting to miss quite a few turns, isn't he, the rider mm. in the green colours? And perhaps he's thinking about that late attack. OK, the brake will be caught. Maybe I can get the most combative prize. Number 21, the yellow jersey, Jai Hindley. Oh, just absolutely in control, Hindley. But what I just saw up in the breakaway is as David's tried to swing across and leave a gap, call the next rider in, Tsubaki... He just kept cruising on backwards, and that takes the momentum out of them. Danese with 24. And number just, four behind him is Caden Groves. Just sort of just a little rub of shoulders as he went through next to the riders from ARA. The two sprinters, the two favourites for the stage, with 18 kilometres to go, are already marking each other. So here's what we see at the back. Your heart rate's gone up already, hasn't it? Yeah, the watching two sprinters the sprinters get starting, ready. To, starting to posture. <laughs> How much of that happens within the group at this point so far out when you're in that position, just letting your rivals know, I'm ready? Quite a lot. I, I, I used to do it a lot. I know I did. I don't know about all the others, but uh, for me it was particularly when racing for the green jersey in the Tour de France. Always keep them in your sights. Know where they are all the time. How do you do that? Stay right next to them or right on their wheel. Get in their personal space. Yeah. But even leading into a finish like this, you just you want to ride good position near the front and the others are doing that to you often find yourselves just right next to each other. Good sprinters, they know where the best spot to be is and you always see them around each other. James Whelan on the front. Another ascension of Anderson Street. Can't afford the next one through from Israel Startup Nation. Well, David's is working. Perhaps the rider in the green colours from Oliver's Real Food Racing. It's simply just fatigue. Well, I'm, I'm still in two minds about David's. He, he looks totally comfortable. He's missing a few turns. Maybe he's just trying to wait for the right moment to go. So I'll just do another turn. We need to maintain this gap a bit, miss a few more turns and then go on his own. I still think he's going to go. He leads them through the corner. Don't quite have to touch the brakes through that corner because it opens up. Now he makes the right-hand turn as they head back towards the Botanic Gardens. This breakaway group, they're working well together, and David McKenzie is down near the finish line, about to watch them whiz by. David McKenzie. I certainly am, Matthew Keenan, and Robbie. I'll tell you what, it's been a great race, hasn't it? No surprises, super fast. That's what we expected around the Botanic Gardens. Perfect weather, in fact. Could we have topped last year? We have big crowd out. Everyone's coming up to the barriers now as we're coming into the dying stages. We'll wait for the break. They're just about coming through now. I'll tell you what, they haven't eased up at all, have they? It's been on. But the sprinters teams, I think, are going to have their day. Here they come through now, hugging the right side. The peloton will come through shortly. I expect it to be a sprinter's day, and I expect Groves and, of course, Danesia. They're the two to fight it out. Like we always see every now and then, and I'm keen on your thoughts, Robbie, is there another sprinter who can challenge either of those two today? Thanks, Maka. I think Mikael Reim, judging on the form of this race so far and the bunch sprints we've seen, what I'm trying to figure out is, is there someone who has the capacity to make an attack the last time over Alexander Street. And I, I think maybe a rider who could be involved in the lead out for EF Pro Cycling, but again, could go on his own and have a go. And there's the, I think there's two of them and see if either of them get a, a, the opening to do it. Jonas Ruch, 
I'm not sure he's quite explosive enough. But someone like Tom Scully, up and over the top with a long-range high-speed effort, that's something really up his alley. So they could maybe, you know, try and pull a Swifty. <laughs> It'll take plenty of horsepower to do so. Tom Scully, he's got one teammate in this breakaway. We're in the pink helmet, and that's James Whelan from EF Education First. At the back, the rider in the blue colours, Jesse Ewart. He started to miss just a couple of turns of pace, and Michael Freeberg of ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast keeps going back to try and encourage him. They've got another good finisher in ARA Pro Cycling. It's Michael Rice. Michael Rice is quick. He was fifth on the stage into Wangaratta. The Herald Sun hot lap. It's James Whelan with the quickest time. Four minutes and 57 seconds. That previous lap was 20 seconds slower than that. Yeah, well, that 4.57, that's lasted since they went on the attack, this group. So the lap where this group formed, that was that really high speed lap of the attacking. That is the hot lap at the moment. And I just know it's going to be that last lap that is the fastest of all, it's going to end up going to one of the sprinters. Yeah. And as we look at this group, the rider going through now, Israel Startup Nation, we look for riders potentially to make a late attack. And you think of good time trialists. How about his teammate, Alex Dowsett, former world hour record? Good time trialist, but I don't think he's got the explosive power to open up enough of a gap to stay away. OK. If you gave him gave him a minute with 10k to go he'd be very hard to catch yes different situation this though requires some, a real burst of speed to open up the gap and then maintain that over around a kilometer and a half number 77 this is joel yates of st george continental moving around the outside trying to improve his position as the kiwi team in the dark blue colors black spoke they're also trying to move themselves up 132 hayden mccormick he follows the wheel of Ethan Batt. Now, another potential attacker from the Black Spoke team, Luke Mudgeway, number 131. Good criterium rider. Not a sprinter, but a good turn of speed, a good attacker. Just depends how he feels after uh, five tough days of racing. Yeah, he's been pretty, pretty good throughout this race, Luke Mudgeway. He's been in a couple of breakaways as well. The sprinter number 13 stretching his back that's Lockie Morton he is a pure climber Lockie Morton and went on the attack on the climb up to Falls Creek Jay Vine in the white colors of Nero Continental he is in fifth position in the overall standings that is an outstanding performance well if and when this breakaway gets caught Vine has to make sure he maintains a good position in the peloton and doesn't get himself caught behind a split and lose those valuable seconds that he's worked so hard to pick up and put himself into fifth. You can imagine he goes back, he gets a bit far back in the peloton, there's a little split, and he loses time. And then Jesse Hewitt is in that main group at the finish. We flip it back over again. And it can happen so quickly with an emotional letdown when you do get caught from the breakaway. You've got to keep concentrating, fight for it all the way to the line. Look at the salt stains on Jesse as he made his way. Oh, sorry, Jay Vine as he made his way over the top of Anderson Street once again. It's a pretty warm day down here in Melbourne, around 26, 27 degrees at the moment. And muggy. It's uh, well by Melbourne standards, it's very, very humid. Uh, I, I can Queensland tell you by, by Queensland standards, it's quite dry still. <laughs> Catterford leads them through. Lots of flags in support of EF Education First because they've got a couple of locals, both Mitch Docker and James Whelan, who's in this breakaway with the pink helmet, are Melburnians. Well, I knew it was going to be a beautiful day in Melbourne today because it's been pouring rain for a week at home on the Gold Coast. And all those messages that you send me throughout the month of August, the middle of winter, telling me how good the weather is at home at your place. Yeah, well, you'll get those again. I only send them when it's good. <laughs> They're still working well together, but their advantage continues to diminish. It's down to just 23 seconds. Three laps remaining around the Botanic Gardens. Gone by a world stage five of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Good crowds built up too. Look at them pressing up against the barriers. Three laps to go of 4.05 kilometres. James Whelan was doing the raise of the hand, calling for a bit more support as he made his way through the crowd. And Whelan, he has been the big driver of this group. I haven't seen anyone do as much work and as long a turns on the front as James Whelan. 28 seconds the gap. Here comes the peloton, all strung out. 
and it is St. George Continental on the front doing the chasing. They are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sunweb and Mitchelton Scott. Well, we've seen all stage from that team, St. George, Connor Reardon from the Gold Coast doing a whole heap of work on the front. At the back now, time trial position draped over the bars, giving a few lengths off. That's Freeberg, for, former Australian champion. He's a big man, Michael Freeberg. You can see why I had my doubts about him being able to win around Mount Buninyong and that big climb. Afterwards, after he won, I even told him that I had my doubts. He said, so did I. He's a tall man, but he's very, very lean. He really improved his climbing over the last couple of years. Such a good win. He's been a world champion on the track in the Omnium. He's represented Australia at the Commonwealth Games as well, but that win was phenomenal. You know, I think since his time on the track and winning that World Omnium Championship, I, I think he must have dropped at least six or eight kilos. He would have. Yeah. Well, for Garant Thomas and Bradley Wiggins... Same. Their weight from when they won gold medals on the track at the Olympics to when they won the Tour de France. I think it was eight kilos. Yep, was. And they weren't overweight when they won those Olympic gold medals. No, but much, much more muscular than when they were wearing yellow jerseys in the Tour de France. David's at the back of the group in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing. Subaki, he's the man in second last wheel. James Whelan fishing into the pockets. Just a little bit more nutrition. You'd think that their morale would be dipping, but their body language is not showing it. They are fighting no, on. Some good, sharp flicks of the elbow. Done on the front. Your turn. Come on, come through. It's international for come on through, isn't it? Yeah, but there's that more relaxed, uh, out along the road, 80 kilometres to go, I'm done, soft sort of flick of the elbow, just almost a flowing sort of there you go. And now it's more of a get on through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like a game of charades. Your turn. This is James Whelan. Number 92 is Michael Freeberg. Jesse Hewitt powering away at the front. That's the governor's house. Nice property. Right in the middle of the garden. That might have been him standing down the front watching the peloton go by. Here's the breakaway group. 17 seconds. Continues to whittle away. The two riders at the back starting to miss turns. Davids has been missing them for a while in the green colours of Oliver's Real Food Racing. And I, I totally get it. We have seen the peloton, that intensity of the chase picking up as well. Last time through the finish line, completely in single file. So missing a couple of turns here from some riders like Davids in the green from Oliver's Real Food. But in the peloton, there's riders there getting to the end of their work day. Their job is just to chase down until they catch this group job done then it's over to the next lot of riders to start to set up the sprinters what is notable is the lexus of blackburn neutral service car from shram is now in front of the breakaway and it's only the shram motorbike which is behind them because the commissaires they've made the call the gap is too small let's clear the vehicles out of the way yep that can go very very quickly when it gets under 20 seconds and it's mitchelton scott that lead the peloton around the corner onto Alexander Street again. And this climb gets bigger every lap. That's the feel in the legs for the riders. Five tough days of racing, two summit finishes, Falls Creek and Mount Buller. I can guarantee you there are some very, very tired legs out there today. And this little hill is becoming quite the ascent. It's like a teenage niece or nephew. It gets bigger every time you see it. <laughs> Encouragement on the side of the road for the breakaway. Cat afford it is at the front. Where's the flick of the elbow as he take them through the corner? He'll take them through the corner. And James Whelan, every time you see some spectators, there's the EF education first off to the right-hand side of the road for him. Come on, I need a little more. Jesse Hewitt at the back of the group for Sapura. At this corner right here, that is what really strings them out when they come into the sprint because there's only one fast line through there. You can't get through two next to each other at full speed. And once you're through their single file and the lead out is on, I think it will split the peloton, particularly because it's a tailwind up to the finish. So all the GC contenders really got to be on their game and paying attention. And the sprinters, therefore, they need to make their position on the way up the hill. Exactly. You can't afford to be dropping back, trying to save your legs a little bit for the sprint. 
you've got to really be punching it up the hill. So that's why this finish favours a guy who can ride two sprints back to back, as it were. Two laps to go. David's in the green colours. He goes through. He's working when he can. His legs are just getting a little heavy, and that is perfectly understandable on stage five. The peloton come through. That gap's not very big at all. In fact, it's just 16 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. And look at the shape of the peloton. Nobody riding side by side anymore. That is one long line. It's like a piece of string. It is well strung out. The gap is small between the breakaway and the peloton. 7.7 kilometres to go. Almost one hour and 50 of racing behind them. And our leaders clinging to what looks to be about a 10 or 12 second gap at the moment. At this point, for the rider in the blue colours, Jesse Ewart, and up towards the front, Jay Vine, who are in sixth and fifth position in the overall standings, they have to start thinking about that prospect of when they do get caught by the peloton, the splits. So they need to be a little bit conservative. It's really easy to get sucked into. And we, as we say Jay that, Jay Vine, the he still goes off the front, giving it absolutely everything. He flicked the elbow. He's, <laughs> he doesn't realise that nobody's able to keep up with him at this point. Well, here comes Davids. He rides himself into the wheel, up and over the top, another turn. So contributing when he can. I'm anticipating that the rider at the back, Michael Freeberg, will attack the next time up Anderson Street Hill. I think so too. Ten seconds. Well, will they even get to Anderson Street this time? So they're down along the Yarra, that flat piece of road, and into the headwind. That 10 seconds can shut down very, very quickly. And Freeberg, if he's going to go, he might need to go before they get to the hill. And the tram neutral service, even the motorbike now, has been cleared out of the gap. Yep. One more behind them. Our camera motorbike. They'll be the last ones to be vacated. And there is the gap. It's not 10 seconds. It's tiny. 6.2 kilometres remaining. Two more times up the short climb of Anderson Street. Well, next time through will be the Bell Lap. Big turn of pace from Vine. He's got Ewart in his wheel tracking him. Uh, the men who are fifth and sixth in the overall classification. Davids, he's shutting down the gap. Freeberg's coming. The rest are being distanced. And the peloton is being led by Sunweb. They don't just need to think about the yellow jersey of Jay, Var, of, uh, Jay Hindley. They're thinking about their sprinter, Alberto Danese. Freeberg bridges across to Jay Vine and Jesse Ewitz. They're not far away from that right-hand turn. Here comes the peloton, the red colours at the front. Sunweb, they've won three out of the four stages, and the stage they didn't win, they got second. Uh, incredibly consistent, but a dominant performance from Jai Hindley in the Jayco Herald Sun Tour, winning both big mountain top finishes. And at the front, well, it's a case of who is going to be last man standing. Here comes the right-hand turn onto Alexander Street. Three men left. Davids is set up. Hewitt, Vine, Michael Freeberg. And now comes the acceleration right of picture. Vine tracks Freeberg. And Freeberg tries to attack on Anderson Street. Half of the breakaway has been caught. Jay Vine is sticking with him, and he goes over the top. The tank is empty for Freeberg. Jesse Ewart goes. So the two strongest from the breakaway in terms of the general classification are the last two survivors. Fifth place overall in the white colours. Sixth place in the overall standings in the blue colours. That's Jesse Ewart in blue. Jay Vine from Nero Continental in white. They're playing a dangerous game here, Matt. I know, obviously, thinking maybe, just maybe, we can hold them off and fight it out for the stage win but they're not going to, they will be caught. But if they get caught and they are behind a big split and lose a chunk of time, they could both be leapfrogged by a guy like Michael Storer. He's the next man behind. He is some 26 seconds behind Jay Vine now, but, but it's still possible. Flick of the elbow from Jay Vine. Jesse Ewitt obliges, and he doesn't just roll through, he sprints through. They're about to hear the bell for the final lap of the Gumbile World Stage 5 in the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. These two have been locked together for five stages. It's fitting that it comes to a close like this.
Oh, still off the front at the moment, but about to be swamped by the peloton. Here they come in the back of shot, led by Rob Power of Sunweb. And these two, when they do get caught, they need to swing straight in and fight for position. Try not to lose any time on the run to the hit finish. That gives you a real appreciation for just how fast the peloton is moving. That bell for the last lap for the sprinters that's like a red rag to a bull it is game on it's time does the hair stand up on your arms when you hear that bell it's stood up right here in the commentary box for robbie McEwen. rob power still on the front it's not textbook perfect rock power in terms of technique but it's got plenty of horsepower yeah it's got a lot of grunt they've been caught so the sprinters will have their day and none of the sprinters teams prepared to go full commitment just yet Sunweb Mitchelton Scott a couple more Sunwebs with Jai Hindley behind them one education first but nobody really together yet the rest of Mitchelton Scott further back look for the yellow and black there together with Caden Groves there's three four in a row back there about 15 or 18 riders back what about the pink colors at EF education first for Marino Hoffman they've got a bit of work to do from that position yeah, but with Scully and Docker, along with Jonas Rutsch, they've definitely got the horsepower to make a big improvement. And when they get to the bottom of this section and turn right along the Yarra, that's where they hit that slight headwind. Big wide road, plenty of opportunities to still move up. But you must be in position for that right-hand turn onto Alexander Street, that last hill. It's Nick Schiltz who is now on the front for the Mitchelton Scott team. They're looking to try and set up the stage for another win for Caden Groves, who won into Wangaratta. Little bit narrow, squeezing through. Mitchelton Scott getting themselves together, the black and the yellow. They're looking well organised, looking around the other side of Sam Bewley, looking for his teammates are Ben Hill in the green jersey. He's got himself up in about seventh position. He's going to try and have a crack at this as well. He's already secured that jersey. See what else he can get. But here come Mitchelton Scott on the right of picture. And now it's the Sunweb team who try to go shoulder to shoulder. It's Sam Bewley, as you predicted, the big powerhouse from New Zealand who gets himself to the front. There's the white jersey on the right, Seb Berwick from St. George Continental, second place overall. He can't afford to lose any positions. Oh, he's still got also behind Bewley, still got uh, Damien Housen. He's up there helping in the lead out as well. Cameron Meyer, he's floated back a little bit far at the moment. He's further back two places behind Jai Hindley. And here comes Jonas Roche in the pink colours for EF Education first with a fair bit of work to do along the flat section next to the Yarra River. Housen now at the front, third place overall, sacrificing for their sprinter. Well, Mitchelton Scott, they are looking like they're going to come up a man short. Yates is trying to get him southern. Here comes Cameron Meyer. He needs to try and get to the front now on the left. Australian champion, but on the right-hand side in the pink, coming to the front at the right time. Education first. Docker, it is, that leads them through. They've got Scully and then Marino Hofflin about to make the right-hand turn. And it's the Israel Startup Nation. It's Dowsett who's at the front. And this is a full acceleration from the man from Israel Startup Nation. Looks behind, sees a little gap. He sees his sprinters in place. Nothing better to do than just go full gas up and over the top. Bumping of the sprinters, trying to get themselves up near the front. It's the scud. This is Tom Scully at the front, followed by a Hofland. Next in line is Caden Groves. Rice has got himself in the mix for ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast. Mikel Ram up there from Israel Startup up nation as well Boivin number 31 is the man first of their team 34 is Ram things are starting to split as well behind little fractures in the peloton Scully still at the front Hofflin swings off and he tries to slip himself in behind Caden Groves but he's been ruffled back and he finds himself sitting behind Guillaume Boivin and Rice has got himself in prime position on the wheel of Caden Groves there's Jai Hindley goes through he looks safe in yellow and Caden Groves, second wheel through that last corner. Look at the speed as they swing into the straight. They are flying through. The yellow jersey is safe on the shoulders of Jai Hindley. But the battle is on for stage honours. Scully at the front. Groves waits behind him. Mikel Ram was trying to move up around the outside. Looking for Hofflin was Scully, but it looks like Hofflin's been pushed back a little bit too far. Waiting for the emergement of Caden Groves. It will be Caden Groves. Celebration time for his second stage victory. 
and the yellow jersey, a little fist pump. Jai Hindley safely across in the white colours for the Visit Victoria Best Young Rider, Seb Berwick, second place overall. Or the favourite for the stage, Caden Groves. He gets the job done. That long right bend around the corner of the finish. He swung out. He lured the others to go. Then he stepped on the gas and he left them just in his wake. It looked to me like it was Hofflin in for second. And Dion Smith, I thought, came through to snatch third place. The teammate of Caden Groves. So a one and three for Mitchelton Scott. I feel as if Caden Groves won at about a kilometre to go. He in was in prime position. Yep, they got him in the right position for the turn onto Alexander Street. A good solid tempo, but he never had to make an acceleration to improve position or defend himself. He was just set in the right spot. And as they hit top speed out of that last corner, he then had enough to look around, see who was where, where he needed to exactly position himself, and then just step on it. The rest had already run their race by the top of Alexander Hill. And Caden Groves, well, he showed it on the flat a few days ago into Wangaratta. And he did it again here in the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. So the young Aussie sprinter from Mitchelton Scott. Here he comes. Low down over the bars. Knows he's got it. Quick look over the shoulder. Victory salute from the teammate. That was Smith. It was Hoffman in second. Rice in fourth. Good Looked ride to be by Mikel Rame, who got himself eventually into fourth. Just to take a look at the overhead. So Groves in front. Easily. Rice just losing the wheel on the run to the line. And Dion Smith was in second wheel for a long, long time up to the line. In fact, he and takes so second. second. He did get second. He began the celebration nice and early, but Caden Groves, that was convincing. And I love the celebration of a sprinter. And it's a case of, look at me. Speaking of look at me, that is the man of the race. The yellow jersey, Jai Hindley, adds his name to the honour roll as the winner of the 67th edition of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. Yeah, the rider to the left, that's Alberto Danese. He looks disappointed because he didn't win the sprint that he thought he could. Let's get down to David McKenzie, who has the stage winner, Caden Groves. I certainly do. Well, Caden, I was listening to Matthew Keenan and Robbie McEwen. They said it looked like you'd won it from a kilometre out. Did it feel like that? No, not at all. I mean, EF uh, really put a lot of pressure on me doing reverse lead out, letting Scully go. And then, uh, then Hoffman was allowed to come in on me. Uh, so, but I, I gave him a gap so I could have a run at him. And uh, yeah, thankfully it was a pretty hard sprint. I had the barrier and uh, no one could come around, so it was good. I'll tell you what, you're good for the confidence, isn't it? Finish your summer in Australia on a high. You've got wings now. Time to head back to Europe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think the team uh, worked really well this week. And I think even the GC result, Damo was really consistent. And the, yeah, the team, team were great all week and they're making me look good. So that always helps. Well done. See you on the podium. Thank you. We just heard then from Caden Groves. I'll get to that in a moment. Smith in second position, then Hoffman followed by Rice. Mikael Ram in fifth. Grau Anderson, McGill, Mudgeway, Bouvant and Stites ran out the top ten. What he said about the last kilometre, I was impressed by the amount of smart decisions that he made. And also saying, no, I didn't feel I had it won from a kilometre. We can see it from what we can see. But as a sprinter, that adrenaline's flowing. You never think it's wrapped up. You're, you're on a razor's edge all the way in. But what he said about EF doing the reverse lead out, they let Scully go and Hofflin dropped back to pick up the wheel, trying to make uh, Groves shut the gap. But he just laid off a little bit. Like he said, I laid off, took a run. I knew I had that bend in the barriers. Everyone had to come the long way around. And he was nice and humble too, thanking the team and making him look good. Well, vice versa as well. Let's get down to David McKenzie, who has the overall race winner, Jai Hindley, with him. I do, Jai, and you're surrounded by the boys, I guess, who helped you get the job done. Must feel like a relief. Yeah, super, super relief to finish the tour off today and get the win and, yeah, repay all the boys for all their hard work they've done this week. We talked yesterday about the history of this great race. Now you're on that honour roll. Has it sunk in at all yet? Oh, not, not just yet, but I think it will. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, eh, to be on that, uh, to get my name on that trophy. It's, yeah, there's some pretty big names on there. So for me, it's, uh, this is a huge win, yeah. Pretty big names. Chris Froome, Bradley Wiggins, Esteban Chavez. That's just a few that pop into my head. This is pretty big, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, it's for sure. It's uh, the biggest win of my career. So I, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to get it today, yeah. Bit of champagne tonight before you get on the plane back to Europe? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all laughing. They're all, all right, where's the party at? Yeah, it'll be a big night, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks. Well done. Thanks. And so he should. He deserves to be able to celebrate it. This is the sprint. Caden Groves, he took that run along the barricades and nobody challenged him from that moment on. No, he took the run along the barricades. It was his teammate, Dion Smith, who was the man who followed him along, taking a fine second place, a big one-two for the team in front of Hofland from EF. They did everything they could to unseat the Mitchelton Scott team. Groves, just too fast. Groves takes the stage. Jai Himley goes out, the winner. The presentation still to come. Presentations just a few moments from getting underway. Jai Himmler, he spoke about the fact that he will be having a celebration tonight and you have to celebrate the victories along the way. You absolutely have to celebrate the victories. And I, I think over the years, it's almost something that doesn't happen enough anymore. Ask any old school rider and they'll, they'll agree. Uh, this sort of new school uh, instant gratification is right next race, next goal, next train again. I think you've got to take the time, sit back, appreciate what's just done. I'm not talking you need to go out and do an all-nighter, no. I mean, can if, you, can if you want, but can, can if you want, but no, I think it really deserves to be celebrated as a team. And it, it, I think that is something that really strengthens that team feeling and morale, that you do actually take the time to celebrate it properly. Yeah, and for a guy like Jai Hindley, this has been a really important block for him. And you can't be up and full gas all year long. So you have to have the up, get that focus, and then have a little bit of a rest so you can peak again. Yeah, this is the perfect time to take a week off, as it were, a mini off season, reset, have a look at just what you've done, keep enjoying it, let it all sink in, and then cruise back into the training and you come back into form so very quickly. I believe those little mini breaks during the season are so very important. Uh, particularly for a guy the age of Jai Hindley, who I imagine he's ridden a couple of Grand Tours already. He can't be too far away from making his debut at the Tour de France. And the Sunweb team, now that Tom Dumoulin has left that team, their big focus for the Tour, of course, will be Michael Matthews winning stages and targeting the green jersey. He's got a strong Australian presence in that team. Luke Roberts is the sports director. Luke has finished second overall in this race. His dad, Wayne, was second overall in this race. He'll love the fact that he's been the sports director to win it. Uh, Luke is one of the great sport directors. I'm not talking about Australia. In the world, really good at developing young riders and with already elite riders, very good at coming up with a race plan and then helping them execute it. Plenty of spectators on hand awaiting the start of the presentations that are just a few moments away. The riders are heading backstage. The presenters are already there. But as you can well imagine, particularly for the stage winner, Caden Groves, the overall race winner, Jai Hindley, they're just getting themselves and their teammates all coordinated. Gun by a world stage five of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour around the Botanic Gardens, 80 kilometres in total. And right from the gun, it was the green jersey for the Bright Brewery. Points classification, Ben Hill going on the attack. Importantly, Robbie, he got himself in that early move, number 65, to pick up the first intermediate sprint to secure that classification. And here it is doing everything that he had to do. He's done it throughout this race, got in the breakaways, gathered the points and did it again. And interestingly, that fight behind him for the overall positions of fifth and sixth between Ewart and Vine. But it was this man, Vine, who did enough in both the intermediate sprints, took the seconds on offer. He will be the man who runs out fifth overall. Jesse Ewart in the blue, next across the line. He'll be sixth overall.
And as the race went on, the peloton crept closer and closer. It was those two men who hung on for the longest, but the sprinters would not be denied. Bell lap almost all together. And it was Caden Groves. He'd already shown himself to be quickest on one stage of this Jaco Herald Sun Tour. And this time, it was a one-two with Mitchelton Scott, Dion Smith, following the sprinter Groves through. And what a way to finish off the tour for that team. And Marino Hofland of EF Education first in third position, just as he was on the first stage, which was from Nagambi into Shepparton. And Hofland's shown his class, one of the first people to congratulate the stage winner, Caden Groves. And then celebrations starting for Jai Hindley. And congratulations all round. And the Sunweb team really dominant in this Jaco Herald Sun Tour. Hindley winning both uphill finishes. Danese winning a sprint stage. Also a second place on a stage as well. In fact, today was their worst stage placing of the entire tour. They've won the team's classification as well. You can fairly say they've swept the board. So the general classification, Jai Hindley going out the winner. There was a small gap. Seb Berwick started the day at 10 seconds. He finishes at 17 seconds behind in second position. Damien Housen in third place. That is the podium. Uh, Nelson Paulus in fourth place. It was then Jay Vine in fifth. Stage results, Caden Groves gets the win ahead of Dion Smith, followed by Marino Hoffman. Michael Rice, another impressive performance in fourth. Mick Ram in fifth position on the stage around the Botanic Gardens. Sprint classification, Ben Hill, he got what he deserved. Caden Groves in second place, Jai Hindley in third. That is reward for aggressive riding for Ben Hill. The King of the Mountains classification, courtesy of Go Tape, Jai Hindley taking the win there. Significant margin to second place, James Whelan. And for the team's classification, no surprises. Team Sunweb, so consistent right across the board. Couple of riders inside the top 10 overall and three stage victories. EF Pro Cycling in second place, followed then by Mitchelton Scott. And for the best young rider, visit Victoria. That is Sebastian Berwick ahead of Rudy Porter and Charles Etienne Creighton in third position. Seb Berwick, Robbie, he has been outstanding. Today's most aggressive rider, thanks to Quest Shepard and Michael Freeberg. That's the right call as well. I think it's a good decision. Freeberg, plenty of work up in the break, keeping them organised, always on the front foot. But going back to Sebastian Berwick, what an incredible performance from the teenager. Just about ready to get started with the presentations. Pat Shaw on the left-hand side of the screen. Rochelle Gilmore, former Commonwealth Games gold medalist from the road race in 2010, helping get things organised. And Robbie, the champagne is waiting. Well, we heard the champagne mentioned when uh, Jai Hindley was interviewed a few moments ago. He was hesitant. His teammates were not. I think he was looking for approval. Just looking for the all clear. I'm sure he'll get the all clear from the sports director, Luke Roberts. He understands the balance between hard work, reward. Hard work, reward. Correct. Pavlov's cyclists. Yes, just like the bell, indeed. Let's take another look at that sprint finish. Well, this is as they swing on to Birdwood Avenue. And look at the gap. That was Tom Scully. So EF Education first. Hoffland tried to swing across and let his teammate go. But Groves was all over it. Up the inside. And he just backed into them as he went through the gap and then really launched his sprint. Look at the gap that opened up. Rice, he paid the price for you know, that positioning over the top of Alexander Street. Really difficult. And it was a straightforward run up to the line for Groves. Drag his teammate through fast finishing Hoffland it was too little too late they tried to outsmart Caden Groves he just simply outpowered them and what I took from that in terms of Michael Rice his sprint was done before he got into the final 200 meters yeah his biggest effort and the effort that he paid for was made over the top of the hill through the kilometre to go. After that, he was just doing everything he could just to hang in there. He saw him have to just sit down and try and push his way through to the line. And as you know, that's the difference at the next level, is getting to the last 200 metres with still a fuel, some fuel tickets to spend. But this is the biggest celebration. The yellow jersey, the rider to his left, that's Michael Storer. He's been his most important teammate. Yep, super domestique all week and in the high mountains. And it's... Maybe a surprise to international viewers that we talk about high mountains here in Australia. Oh, yes, we do have them. Okay, 
maybe not as high as the, the Alps and the Pyrenees, but I'll tell you what, when you're racing up to over 1,800 metres and the climbs are 30 kilometres long like Falls Creek, they are high mountains. This is the real deal. Yeah, without question. Falls Creek, 30 kilometres. Mount Buller, 16 k's long. And Mount Buller is actually more difficult than Falls Creek, even though it's almost half the distance. The skyline of Melbourne and down across Flinders Street train station. That's Federation Square, just the other side of it. And if we look further along, you can see the famous MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which for a number of years, back in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, hosted the Austral Wheel Race. It used to have a velodrome around the, the fence line and draw massive crowds too. And the Prime Minister of Australia, after Federation was formed in 1901, presented the winner's cheque and the winner's prize in 1901 for the winner of the Austral. There's the Sydney Meyer Music Bowl, just at the bottom of the picture. That's where they host the uh, Carols by Candlelight on uh, Christmas Eve. There's Albert Park, the scene of the F1. And the Shrine of Remembrance in the form ground as well. And the F1, you'll be looking forward to that in March. And further back down, you can see Port Phillip Bay, St Kilda. Albert Park with its golf course. Have you ever played golf there? I have. How'd you go? Oh, let's not talk too much more about that. That was that was back in the day when I was a 27 handicapper. What are you now? You're 14. Are you? Still plenty of work to do. Oh, you've got plenty of time to do it. Great game. And Marino Hofflin steps up to collect third place. Marino Hofflin, he likes a slightly uphill finish. He's more of a drag uphill Michael Matthews style sprint as opposed to the flatlands Dion Smith so versatile very versatile and just really strong he can take on just about any terrain winner of the stage his second win of the race his second win for Mitchelton Scott Caden Groves as a sprinter Robbie so important to get off to a winning start it is it's all about confidence of course you could be sometimes going really well and just not crack a win so to come here to this race his first real team race of the season at a UCI level and get two stage wins, really important. And look at the body, the two sprinters on the left, the real sprinters, Hofflin and Groves, their body types by comparison to Smith. Yeah, and particularly look at their legs, the calf muscles. Really illustrates well the different types of athletes within cycling. If you stand one of the climbers up there next to them, you'll really see a massive difference. But uh, right in the middle there, Caden Groves, Built like a real sprinter, built like a tank. And his attitude, sprinters, got, they have to have a certain level of swagger about them, but he's also got innately real professionalism. You need to have a, a controlled aggression that you can switch on and off. Yeah. Use it when you need to in the race, but you can't live like that. No. And the gentleman that you see on the left on the road, the black with the white stripe down the centre of his back, that's the sports director for Sunweb. That's Luke Roberts. He's the man who called the shots. He's Olympic Games gold medalist from Athens in the team's pursuit. It looks like he's getting ready to become team photographer when his riders get onto the podium with his the phone smartphone ready. at the ready. Caden Groves once again. Champagne time for Caden Groves. Hot lap. He got the quickest lap, 4.35, courtesy of the Herald Sun, just as you predicted. Well, I said it would be a sprinter at the end. The early mark was set by James Wheel in a 4.57 when the break went away. But look at that, 22 seconds faster in that last lap the last than when lap. the break got away. And that was a fast lap. So that just shows you the intensity of the final lap of the race when the lead out's in full effect and topped off by a world-class sprinter. And that's 40 seconds faster than what the average lap speed was. They were going. Event sponsor Andrew Ryan from Jaco Caravans with his son Rupert. Who's just trying to work out what's going on. And it's the red jersey for the Quest Shepherd and most aggressive prize. Rupert's been out there collecting fallen leaves on the verge of autumn. <laughs> Michael Freeberg, Australian National Road Champion from 2019 former world Omnium champion on the track, riding for ARA Pro Racing Sunshine Coast.
our most aggressive rider of today. Former Australian national road champion last year. It's unlucky not to be in a World Tour team. Right place, right time, sliding doors moments. In yeah, his it is a matter of that. It certainly is. He's good enough. <laughs> Next up is the Visit Victoria white jersey for the best young rider. This is for riders under the age of 23. So you have to have been born after the 1st of January 1997. And this is Jerry Ryan, who has been arguably the most important man in Australian cycling since 1991, when he funded Kathy Watts' bid for Olympic gold in Barcelona, which she won. And beyond that, he's also funded and supported so many projects, the Victorian Institute of Sport, national teams, Cycling Australia, and is behind the Mitchelton Scott professional team, our Australian World Tour team. That is funded by Jerry Ryan. This is Sebastian Berwick. Five years ago, when Sebastian was just 16 years of age, a guy by the name of Robbie McEwen said, Kino, watch this kid. He can really climb. Yesterday, to the top of Mount Buller, Robbie, oh, did he climb. He was second on the stage, but he threw everything at trying to win this race overall. He gets the white jersey as the Visit Victoria Best Young Rider. This is just the start. I'm sure this is just the start. This is where he's introduced himself to the, the big public. But those who already knew, they just sort of give you a wink at this one and say, I told you. Every Queenslander in the cycling community watching this is saying, we've known this for ages. Now it's the Go Tafe King of the Mountains jersey. And this will be uh, taken out by Jai Hindley. He doubled up on both mountaintop finishes. Well, you didn't have to be a mathematician to know who was going to win this one because if you can win both mountaintop finishes in this race, you were a shoe in for this jersey. There just weren't simply enough points on offer anywhere else. To win to the top of Falls Creek and to the top of Mount Buller, they are two huge climbs, as you referenced before. This is a tough race when you're going up both those climbs. The most mountainous tour in a, on Australian soil. Well done, Jai. We will get you back, no doubt. Jai Hindley, uh, continuing the, the rise that we've seen throughout his amateur days, racing in Europe, performing well in the really tough French and Italian stage races, uh, races like Val d'Osta, the Mont Blanc. Always really competitive in the high mountains, uh, also in the Tour de l'Avenir. So now translating that to his early pro career. Now the green jersey for the Bright Brewery points classification. And as David McKenzie just said, this was a real battle. The sprinters and then Ben Hill, who wasn't competing directly with the sprinters. He was doing his own race and Ben Hill gets the reward. Yep. So for a guy like Ben Hill to win this jersey, he had to get himself in every single breakaway in this race pick off points as he went along and build his total and then see if he could finish up there in the top few on one of the flat stages. And but it's been a win of perseverance. And the cramp of the season. <laughs> yeah, the cr cramp of the year already. It's only February, but it's cramp of the year. Everybody else is riding for second place in that competition. Or not riding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like he was when he cramped. He was rolling through to the front, three k's from the next sprint. If he had have gotten there, he wouldn't have had to worry about the breakaway today. Foot involuntarily out of the pedal as cramp set in. Well, next up is going to be the winners of the team's classification. This is Stephen Drake, who's the CEO of Cycling Australia, and he was the Australian National Road Champion in 1993 and a Commonwealth Games representative in 1994. Former teammate of mine back in the mid-90s in the Australian national team. And the winners of the team's classification is, of course, the Sunweb team, the team of race winner Jai Hindley, but also up there, Alberto Danese, a stage winner of this race. That's Alberto Danese to the left-hand side of the screen with the first handshake. Next in line, this is Florian Storr. Then it is Michael Storer, followed then by Rob Power. Next in line is Max Cantor. Then it is Krau Anderson. And at the end of the line is Jai Hindley. Well, they won this competition by over five minutes to the next team. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, the top three teams in the team's classification, World Tour teams, Sunweb, Education First and Mitchelton Scott. And they're all targeting Jai Hindley. 
pick on the yellow jersey. That is really going to smell. Well, you always need a shower after a race. <laughs> Champagne showers. It's a team sport won by individuals, so this must be fantastic for Jai Hindley to be able to share the moment on the podium with his teammates. You know, I think even if he hadn't, if they hadn't won the team's classification, I'm sure we would have seen them up there anyway with Jai Hindley when he accepts the final yellow jersey as race winner. But a nice moment for the whole team. They've come here, they've worked very hard, taken on and accepted that favouritism role. Jai Hindley, one of the big favourites coming in. They're calling Luke up. Crow Anderson is the one. Luke, come up. Luke doesn't like the limelight. And he also doesn't like being showered in champagne by his riders. Too clever to get roped in for that one. As you could hear in the background from David McKenzie. Next up is the top three overall. Hopefully they've got runners on with good yep, grip. I was just thinking exactly the same thing. Bike shoes can be really slippery up there. Bike shoes are slippery at the best of times. It can be. I once saw Mark Cavendish go head over heels on the podium in Belgium after uh, the podium was soaked with champagne. He bounced straight back up. This is Tom Salem with the yellow jersey from the Herald and Weekly Times. Jerry Ryan has the trophy. I love that trophy. Of the 67th edition of the Jayco Hill Sun Tour. The Mitchell and Scott is the former winner, Damien Housen. Damien Housen steps out in third position. All smiles. He started here as a team support rider. Simon Yates said with 10 kilometres to go up Falls Creek. Damo, it's all yours. Well, he's been able to step up. A former winner of the race, Damien Housen. When he won, it was Jai Hindley he beat on the mountaintop finish. But what about this for a second place? This, for many people, is like a win. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Second place for Sebastian Berwick. Jai Hindley, this was one of the races he targeted. He has knocked it out of the ballpark. It's time to put on the final yellow jersey and add his name to the honour roll that includes Tour de France winners Bradley Wiggins, Chris Froome, other greats of the sport such as Simon Gerrans and Esteban Chavez. As a Western Australian, he joins Barry Waddell, a Western Australian who has won this race five times. Jai Hindley is now amongst a prestigious honour roll. Well, I'm sure he'll be very proud when he sits down and has another look at that honour roll. And the names engraved on this trophy held by Jerry Ryan will now hand that over to the 2020 winner of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour. And one of the stars of the moment, Matthew Van Der Poel, his dad, Adri, won this race in 1988. Jai Hindley goes out the winner. Robbie McEwen, I think this is the beginning of the big season for Jai Hindley. Well, let's hope so. It started off exactly the right way. He takes the win. It's Sebastian Berwick in second position. Damien Housen is in third. That brings us to a close for the 67th edition of the Jayco Herald Sun Tour.